Day for the Bloomfield Township Board of Trustees meeting of April 10th. If we could start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, I like it better with an awesome. All the stereo effects behind <laughs> yeah. us. <laughs> All right, so first we do have public comment. Um, because we have a public hearing tonight as well, and we want to make sure everybody is counted at the right time. We want to explain when to... Sure, so, so tonight's public comment, um, anybody that's here to speak about the special assessment districts, <laughs> that's a, a specific public hearing, so those public comments will be taken during that public hearing. All the rest of the public comments that, that are had on other items besides the special assessment district, that will be done momentarily. Um, when you do get to the public hearing for the special assessment district, if you want to speak in it, uh, you should state your name and your address and whether you're for it or against it. All you need to do um, to object to the special assessment district is state those items. You don't have to go into detail. You can if you want, provided you stay within the time limits, but you don't need to. You just need to state your name and address at that point so and that would make it count towards the that program. would make it count to preserve whatever rights of appeal people wanted to have so. okay okay and, and a couple additional ideas to to, to add in um, you know public comment is for the members of the public to address the board of trustees and we're eager to hear what you may have to say um, uh, we ask that you provide your name and address when uh, coming to the microphone to speak and uh, also uh, each person is limited to three minutes and there is a timer um, that my assistant here will have up on the board. Um, you may also hear a knock on the, on the counter, which means there's about 10 seconds left. So just so all, you all know, um, welcome to our meeting tonight. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. So if anybody wants to come on up, and then you can always uh, line up if you want to get ready, uh, come straight up here. My name is Mary Alice LaDuke. I'm a Bloomfield Township resident. I am here to point out the miscarriage of equity with the board's decision to double, the more than double, the fixed cost of my water and sewer bill based on pipe size. The doubling of my fixed cost exceeds the rates of households with smaller sizes by a whopping margin. A 1.5 inch pipe is double the size of a 3 quarter inch pipe, yet the fixed costs are nearly three times greater for water and 2.7 times greater for sewer. This is not equity, it is price gouging some people. Pipe size is not a determinant in potential use of water. Potential use of water has to do with choices made by a user as to frequency of washing, watering lawns, and the number of people in a household. A home with a 3 quarters inch pipe has more potential than that of a home with a 1.5 inch pipe if the residents choose to use a lot of water. Many people with 1.5 inch pipes are empty nesters who are not high potential users. The township is using the faulty recommendations of the consulting firm as rationale for this decision to triple the fixed costs on 1.5 inch pipes. This is wrong. No one on this board had a tripling of their fixed costs. In fact, most of you had a reduction in your fixed costs because you zapped the higher fixed costs on the 2100 households with a larger pipe. The pipes were in the house when I purchased it. Now they will contribute to lower property values since similar homes do not have this onerous added costs. Since potential water use is not based on pipe size, all households should pay the same fixed costs and water usage should be increased since this, this is where the true costs for the community come from, peak usage. People who do not conserve water should be charged more since this is where the Bloomfield Township costs for water increase significantly. How about time of day usage for pricing? This would be a better incentive to reduce usage and rates. The township should consider a public service communication campaign to encourage water conservation, especially during peak demand times. This is what DTE has just done. If more households and businesses reduce water consumption during peak periods, everyone would benefit and you wouldn't have to price gouge those of us with 1.5 inch pipes. Thank you. 
you. Good evening. Uh, Don Greenwell, Jr., 35-year resident of the township. You know my address. You send me a tax bill all the time. <laughs> I'm here to talk about item number five. Consider award of the solid waste program. Garbage pickup for the homeowners. Uh, in full disclosure, I have no dog in this fight as far as uh, the, number, the low bidder, Titan, or the second bidder, priority. I don't know them. I'm looking at the facts. I've awarded billions of dollars in construction contracts and been recipient of more. I, I think I know a couple things about bid and awarding. But this is no small award. Don't think it's just garbage pickup. This is a $32 million a year award. Over the life of the country, you talk about a quarter billion dollar award. It's a lot of money. So what happened? You're asking the homeowners today to go to the second bidder. Pay a premium of $1.5 million every year, the homeowners. What's that? $12 million over the course of the contract? You're asking, oh, that's a premium. Things know, we all know things are going up. You've got water and sewers, good one. Taxes, uh, price of whatever. You're asking us to pay a premium of $12 million over the eight year contract. So let's, from what I've surmised in some emails, what's going on here. The second bidder priority apparently has the trucks and the equipment and the manpower and the managers just sitting there waiting for our award July 1st. And I think that puts up a red flag. Why do they have all of just sitting there waiting for us? You, in private business, you just don't have that kind of capital sitting there waiting on a if come. Either, either they lost a contract or they had advanced knowledge that's coming down the pike, I don't know. What I surmise, the, the low bidder was gonna use electric trucks. That, that, that's a sales trick there. Uh, another reason I've heard, they have dedicated service reps and technology on their trucks, cameras. Service rep, we're talking about call center for a million and a half dollar premium. And cameras on the trucks, they all have that. Real time feed, all that, they all have it. We, for a million and a half dollar, oh shoot, there's 24 seconds. <laughs> Reasons of, it's too much money. It's just too much money. I, I, I'm telling you, we didn't even, we didn't even know, we didn't even interview the low bidder after the bids. We discounted him, threw him out. He's not qualified. It's backed by the Rizzo name, the, the people that didn't get in trouble. They, they know something about garbage. $12 million, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Ronald Fenwick, uh, 2536 Whiteley in the township. Uh, I've got a little different take on the, uh, on the priority waste company. It doesn't appear that the proper vetting of this new contractor was done by the township. Online is a discussion about residents of Dearborn Heights having a problem with this contractor and one resident who had a serious problem with an employee of this company having threatened them. Also, the Better Business Bureau site online also has numerous very bad ratings for this company. A township resident has also posted that there was a problem with this contractor in Washington Township, Michigan. In comparing the proposed rates to be charged single family township households by GFL option one, and that's a company that uh, our township has been with for a very long time. The total cost over eight years is $2,114.08 for someone like myself with a single family residence versus priority waste, which is charging a total cost of $1,950.20. Uh, or only $198.88 more, or approximately $25 more per year. The only differences in the proposal of these two contractors, other than the cost to replace, purchase a large recycling bin, 
is that GFL will charge $45 per appliance to remove the refrigerant, whereas Priority Waste says they will not charge. Perhaps the board can tell us just how many refrigerant removals were done by GFL during the previous contract year. Uh, anyhow, uh, most of those are done by people when they buy a new refrigerator or air conditioner, those companies will take the, take the old appliance away. GFL has done an excellent job for my family and I also think for our residents. And I'm not aware of any concerns, especially any similar to those mentioned here in involving <coughs> priority waste. Also, the increase in total proposed cost of GFL is minimal, even considering the refrigerant removal charge. For these reasons, I'm requesting that the board not enter into this contract with priority waste and instead contract with GFL, preferably with option two, which is a flat rate versus the variable rate in option one. Well, a few seconds here. As to water and sewer rates, um, my objection is similar to the woman who spoke earlier. The meter size has nothing to do with water consumption and should be taken out of the uh, calculation of water rates. And if it's going to be kept in, people with secondary meters should be also charged the fixed rate, perhaps at a, at a lower amount. And there shouldn't be any change uh, to monthly billing, quarterly billing. Quarterly billing has been the way it's been for numerous years and should stay that way. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Mark Antakli. I reside at 1550 Georgetown, and I'm also a precinct delegate in the township. Uh, regarding the uh, cost basis of water and sewer rates, the township attorneys had mentioned that there has to be a valid cost basis. So when we look at our rates, which is on your, in your packet, we see an uh, inch size per meter, and it's very easy to calculate the cross-sectional area of the pipes and it's not based on the cross-sectional area in the pipes. We had a guy in from MIT a couple weeks ago, and he even validated that, one of our residents. Regarding the expenditure, on September 12th, the township only approved $300,000 for the water and sewer meter project. They didn't prove the full amount. When was that approved? And does that include the cost of the meters? Because we've seen different numbers from September 12th until now. What are the actual numbers being approved and validated? I think residents should know what that is and how it would impact future rates. Regarding opt-out, DTE allows us to opt out of smart meters. Can township residents opt out as well of smart meters? And why should township residents pay more if they opt out because you're using surplus funds to pay for the changes. Let's take a look at the numbers also in the report to validate the payments. What we have here is an estimate of 32 million in revenue. That's up 6 million from the end of last quarter. And the expenses were 17 million, just above 17 million. The projections in the report say that the revenue is going to go up 6 million to 32 million, and expenses are going to go up 9 million. $9 million in one quarter from 17. Does that make any sense? No, I don't think so. It's in your packet from back in January. I hope you ask those questions. Again, what we also see is in the breakdown, we have one of the numbers used is operate, operations and uh, maintenance, seven million. What's in the seven million? Does it include depreciation? That's over $2.3 million typically. Based on that, you're overcharging us by 2.3 million. That's 6%. So you should be able to maintain rates and even drop them 3% and still hit your revenue threshold if that number is in there because you have a second line item, rate funded capital. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Melissa Bozarde. I reside at 1709 Orchard Lane in Bloomfield Township. I'm going to read my statement that I posted on next door. Boonville Township residents get ready to start burning your trash in the backyard because the Board of Trustees has been advised to switch our waste hauler based on cameras mounted on the truck. Our current hauler, Green for Life Environmental, has served our community splendid, splendidly for years. When the pandemic first started in 2020, I saw many of my neighbors spending down shut time time cleaning out tons of unwanted items. There was a visible surge of trash at the curbs. And how much more did you and I have to pay to have all that extra trash hauled away by GFL? Nothing. That is a sign of a company working with our residents during a crisis. It's also proved that GFL is large enough to handle such situations without missing a beat. Do we make a change from, from that company for the sake of adding cameras to a garbage truck? We know the importance of teaching kids recycling so that they may develop lifelong habits to preserve natural resources. GFL has a teacher that goes into local classrooms with programs targeted to the age of students doing just that. Schools need such instruction to earn their green school designation. As far as I know, GFL is the only company that, provi that provides this education to their schools, always at no charge. Should we lose that valuable service for the sake of adding cameras to the garbage truck? I recently heard that GFL opened Midwest's most technologically advanced recycling center right next door in Pontiac. This plant uses cutting edge sorters to extract most of the contaminated material, thus diverting perfectly reusable recyclables from being buried in landfills. GFL hands down the recycling leader in Michigan. Should, should we lose the access to that facility to add, add cameras to the garbage truck? It is my strong opinion of staff that the Committee of the Priority Waste uses logistic driver coordinates with provide, will provide the high levels of customer service to high levels of, um, that is expected in Bloomfield Township? I don't think so. Cameras, it's a silly gimmick. You know, I had over 100 responses to this, and most, I would say 95% of them were in favor of keeping GFL. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Leonard Walkowitz. I um, live in Colberry Hills, and as my person earlier said, you know the address, you send me a bill all the time. Um, I just want to second the earlier presentation um, I responded to that woman's comments on neighborhood.com uh, and I pretty, very much agree with it. Uh, I have no problem after 35 years with, uh, well, GFL hasn't been there for 35 years, but since the time GFL has been handling the waste uh, disposal, I've had no problems with them. Uh, I don't know all the facts, so I'll just be very brief. I'm in favor of staying with GFL. And very briefly on the water issue, um, <laughs> I can't remember in 30 years of living in Bloomfield Hills that there's ever been any agreement about any of the water and sewer pricing. So that's a thing that's just going to go on forever, apparently, because nobody seems to have the answers. Nobody seems to want to make the answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else for general comment, public comment? Okay, we will call. Last chance for general public comment. The SAD comments will come later, but are we sure that no one else is here to speak? Okay, we'll close public comment. Uh, next, we'll go to the board minutes of March 27th. We've all had a chance to look them over. Unless there's any changes, I'd look for a motion. So moved. Moved by Trustee Shostak. Support. Support by Treasurer Keeps. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. So next we have the police department 
uh, recognition office promotion officer promotions and we have Ch uh, Chief Gallagher and Captain Nolan. Thank you for having us again. Uh, I think this is one of many nights with the transition we have of, uh, going on in the police department right now that uh, we'll, we'll be seeing many more of our people up here in the in relatively near future. A um, couple things. Uh, first, this week is uh, appreciation of 911 telecommunication telecommunicators week. Um, I think it's important to recognize our dispatchers. We are very fortunate here in Bloomfield Township to have our own dispatch center. Uh, across the county and across the state. In my opinion, we have one of the best, if not the best dispatch centers around, and we are complimented for that. Um, I did notice tonight um, in the back row that we have two of our retired dispatchers here, probably for promotion stuff, but uh, it's very nice to see them here on this week. So it runs from t uh, the 9th to the 15th, um, and I think it's very important that we just take that moment to recognize our dispatchers. Um, they have a very tough job. They are the voice behind um, a lot of chaos and the calm, um, as we've seen, unfortunately, too well, too much in the, uh, recently across this country, let alone uh, in Bloomfield Township. So um, we want to give our you know shout out to them and make sure they know we appreciate them um, and, the, and the, really the thankless job that they do um, to bring to save lives as our lifeline for the majority of us. Mo the majority of us do not spontaneously run into a crime, uh, running out of a house. It's usually co come through a dispatcher um, or, or somebody that tells us where we need to be. Um, and it, uh, it's just, it's an amazing job that they do in the calm. And I, you know, uh, Treasurer Keeps had, had the, uh, he walked downstairs the other day, right in the middle of uh, two major incidents going on and um, had some very valid questions of the dispatchers of how do they keep two incidents with, that were priority incidents going on at the same time, uh, keep them straight, stay focused on, on the task at hand. So um, I think it's important that we recognize them. So. <laughs> Officer Box, come on uh, up the front row for a second if you don't mind. We have the opportunity tonight. Um, just, uh, Officer Box came to us from Wayne State University uh, probably about a year ago. Oh uh, yeah, you're good there. Um, and Beautiful. with that, we had an opening in our K-9 uh, division here recently and uh, Officer Box coming from Wayne State was a K-9 officer for several years. Uh, nobody internally at that time uh, put in for our K-9 position. So by default and by selection, <laughs> but being that he didn't meet and the- by well, but, but there, I don't mean that in a negative way. <laughs> I, I don't mean that in a negative way. He didn't, at that time, the minimum criteria for the internal was at least two years on job. He's only had a year. So here he comes by default from K, the, by uh, Wayne State by as a K-9. We are excited for him. Um, he, he comes here with lots of things. There was a brand new police car sitting out there for him. Uh, but he brings with him Havoc. Um, and Havoc is a, was Officer Box's K-9 down in Wayne State, and we were able to re, uh, recertify him here in Bloomfield Township. What's unique about him is we've never had a bomb dog here, um, an explosive dog, and, and Havoc is that, and Tom is um, certified in that, which is important to us. Um, with all the landmarks that we have in Bloomfield Township, we now have our own dog internally that can help out on certain types of threats that we may, may face. So we're excited. A little background, too, on Havoc. Um, when Colin Rose from Wayne State University was uh, murdered in the line of duty, I believe Havoc was his dog, um, and Tom graciously took on Havoc, uh, and so we have a little bit of good history here um, with, with Tom so, um, and Havoc. And he just, what, got, he's getting recertified and commissioned very soon, so he's, he's riding around and getting reacclimated in the car. So he's certified on patrol, just got to get explosives down. Just recertifying explosives. So, um, if Tom, if you want to explain what kind of dog, I don't know anything about <laughs> the specialties of the dogs. Do you mind um, pushing yeah. that or letting him talk? Yeah, about absolutely. Like. <laughs> that way we can all hear. Thoughts? Okay, good boy. So, Havoc is a, he's an eight year old Belgian Malinois. Uh, so, if the difference between a Belgian Malinois and a German Shepherd, because everyone knows a German Shepherd. Uh, German Shepherd's more so of a power car. Malinois are a little bit sportier, a little bit faster. Uh, they have a ton of drive. They want to just, they, and they love to work. Uh, Havoc has been certified for, would have been five years now as a canine officer. Uh, this will be the, his sixth year. Uh, him being eight years old, he's, he has quite the uh, experience. 
and so we're looking forward to be able to. I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to get back to work with them, uh, and just really uh, help the township out as much as possible. So thank you. And Tom knows he would have been a uh, tough beat to <laughs> as an experienced canine. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? Do we throw the dog in at all? No? Yeah. Okay. That's right. Ne next time. He'll, he'll, yeah. He says he'll like raise his paw, you know. Yeah, I was going to say make him raise his paw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah I, I met him for the first time today. Uh, Captain Nolan's been with but he's a fantastic oh, dog. So um, I'm glad he was working tonight and uh, kind of a surprise to bring him in. Vince is going to have a little trouble because I have my partial to Vince was my favorite, but now I mean, there might be some competition. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're a great resource for an agency to have. We are very fortunate to have two well trained canine officers. Um, and be part of the teams that we are with them. Uh, that they're utilized quite frequently, whether it's here in the township or, or by our partners. So on to promotions. Thanks, Tom. Dan Brown. Dan. You, can, you can stand over here. Right here. So Dan Brown is being promoted to captain. It was effective April 1st. Uh, Dan started in Bloomfield Township on June 17th, 2002. Uh, he's an alumni of uh, Waterford Kettering High School, uh, still lives in Waterford with his family today. And he's uh, the son-in-law of our retired detective, Randy Armstrong, who uh, served 31 years uh, with our agency. So Dan and I were talking the other day and um, his wife Mandy has been lived with a cop for her whole life. <laughs> I'm not saying how old she is, so. Um, but her whole life. She's got more, I think we probably should have hired her because I think she's probably uh, really good at this job. Um, but just so you, we go by badge number, goes by sequential order. So I'm 231, Dan's 242, Randy was badge 32. So it just shows there's uh, 210 people. Um, Dan earned his bachelor's degree from Walsh College in 1996. Uh, he spent several years in the private sector before attending Oakland Co uh, Police Academy and hiring on with our agency. Uh, Dan was an evidence technician on the road, a reality-based training instructor, and a role player for that. He became a field training officer in July of 2013. Uh, he was promoted to sergeant in April of 2017, where he uh, served time both as road patrol and investigation sergeant. Uh, he was promoted to a lieutenant in June of 2019. Again, spent time as road patrol, and then the last year when the retirement of uh, Lieutenant Schwab uh, took over our investigations. Um, and then was promoted, obviously, April 1st of 2023 to the rank of captain. And uh, Dan graduated from the Michigan State School of Staff and Command last June, which is a police executive school uh, that provides police executive level training um, related to all types of leadership and uh, problem-based learning. Uh, Dan's received numerous awards throughout his uh, career and including the Officer of the Year in 2008. So we're excited for Dan to join uh, the team. Uh, the, te the candidates who went for captain set the bar extremely high. We are beyond fortunate to have the talent that we do within this agency. Uh, and we lost um, many hours of sleep trying to make these decisions. So, uh, but Dan, we're excited to have you as part of the team. He's now our administrative captain, and he's learning really quickly the uh, administrative side of police work, of paying bills and signing people up for training, and kind of not the nuts and bolts of pu pushing a police car, but the other behind the scenes thing. So congratulations, Dan. We're happy to have you on board. Okay, this is one of my uh, most um, happiest moments as clerk to be able to swear in new officers and new employees and others within the township and um, congratulations on your promotion. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure working with you in the couple of years I've been here already. So to make it official, if you raise your right hand and repeat after me, please. I, Daniel Brown. I, Daniel Brown. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And I'll support the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I will support the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I will faithfully discharge my duties. And I will faithfully discharge my duties. As captain for the Charter Township of Bloomfield. As captain for the Charter Township of Bloomfield. <laughs> Police Department. Police Department. To the best of my ability. To the best of my abilities. Congratulations. Thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, yeah, and I'll let Dan introduce his family. Oh my gosh. So this whole front section here. <laughs> my wife Mandy, 
our three kids, Anna, Andrea, and Nicholas, my mother-in-law, Sean, my mom, my brother, my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, my nieces and nephews, um, my daughter's boyfriend, Dylan. Um, <laughs> Everybody and their sisters here tonight. I truly appreciate the outpouring of support. Um, I'm very humbled today to stand up here in front of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it's truly an honor. Thank you. And I'm glad everybody's here because uh, it just shows the support that we need as first responders. It's uh, been a trying time with the, in the last uh, couple years, and it's important to have that family support. Mike Buchek. <laughs> He's got supporters, too. <laughs> Mike Buchek uh, has been promoted to the rank of lieutenant, also on April 1st, effective. Uh, Mike hired on in Bloomfield Township on March 7th, 2005. Uh, Mike was my first trainee uh, as a new, uh, field training officer, which was kind of nice because I kind of cheated. Uh, he had five, him and I hired on about the same time as police officers. So he came to us uh, from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, with five, oh, just about five years of experience. So I got broken by somebody who had just as much time in a little busier department, so I learned a lot as well. He's a graduate of All Saints uh, Central High School in Bay City. Uh, he attended Saginaw Valley before transferring to Charleston Southern University, where he played baseball. Uh, he also attended South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy, which is down there uh, near Mount Pleasant. Uh, he followed his dad's lead, uh, lead uh, who was a Bay City police officer and narcotics detective for many years, uh, and then transferred on to be part of the uh, Fraternal, Order of, Fraternal Order of Police. Um, Mike, again, I said it, started his uh, career in the Mount Pleasant Police Department in 2000 becoming home, before coming home to Michigan and hiring on here in Bloomfield Township. Uh, Mike has served our agency as an evidence tech and an FTO. Uh, since 2013 for FTO. And for those field training officers, one of the most important positions in our department. Uh, Mike has taken on the role as probably before he got promoted to sergeant was one of our senior FTOs and took on many uh, recruits. And, and it's a 17 week grueling program for the recruits, but the FTOs put just numerous hours of time and energy into the, to the new hires and, and can directly impact somebody's uh, career from day one, uh, which which is very important to us. Uh, Mike is our reality-based uh, active shooter training instructor. He's an OCTAC instructor. Um, for several years now, he's been leading in one of our proctors for training, so maybe some of the trustees have gone through it. Uh, but he, him and his team, and uh, at the time, Sergeant Weiss, they are Lieutenant Weiss now, um, <laughs> It could conduct all our annual training uh, for reality-based and active shooter training, and they, they provide all that training throughout the township as well uh, to, to businesses. Mike was promoted as, to sergeant in February of 2022, and because of all our retirements, uh, quick promotion to lieutenant here on April 1st, 2023. So Mike was in our detective bureau for a short stint before being promoted, but uh, he's back on the road on midnights where I feel like he just keeps ending up uh, based on seniority at times. So uh, we're excited to have Mike as, a, as another leader in our agency. So Mike, congratulations. So congratulations, Mike, and I uh, look forward to working with you more and more Thank in you. your new role. And please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Michael Buchek. I, Michael Buchek. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I'll support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I'll support the Constitution of the United States of America. And I'll support the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I will support the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I will faithfully discharge my duties. And I will faithfully discharge my duties. As Lieutenant. As Lieutenant. For the Charter Township of Bloomfield Police Department. For the Charter Township of Bloomfield Police Department. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll introduce who I have here real quick. I have my mom and dad, John and Pat. As Chief said, my dad retired as a lieutenant from the Bay City Police Department. I have my wife, Allie, my daughter, Riley, my son, Jack, and Brady, and our good friends, Suzanne, Luke, and their children, Nolan and Reagan. So, thank you. Mike can't get away with too much. His wife's also a uh, crime scene investigator for Oakland County and a firearms expert. So there's no, he's not getting away with much. So she's a great resource to us as well. Sergeant Racine, come on up. 
And now you get to pick out which daughters <laughs> might be his. <laughs> Andy was promoted to sergeant, effective uh, April 1st of this year as well. He was hired here at, in Bloomfield Township on April 11th, 2005. And he's one of our many UP graduates uh, from Nagani High School in the Upper Peninsula. He graduated from Northern Michigan University and attended Mid Michigan Police Academy in Lansing, uh, where his brother is, uh, is he still an ER doctor? Yep, his brother's an ER doctor up at Sparrow, if I'm, is that? Oh, yeah, he's a Sparrow Hospital. Sparrow Hospital, so. Um, Andy spent time with the Marquette uh, County Sheriff's Office as a non-certified jail deputy before um, moving on to the police academy. So Andy's been, uh, an, it was an evidence technician here. He served as the Lasser High School, were you the last school liaison for Lasser? Uh, from 2009 to 2014, so he was also instrumental in helping start planning the uh, new high school and the merger of the high schools um, when that was coming down. Uh, he spent many years there coaching, uh, as part, of, uh, as part of his duties there and really relished in that role um, as a school liaison. He became a field training officer in October of 2016. As you can see, our field training officers seem to be, that seems to be the step to uh, leadership roles within our agency uh, further down the line. He most recently uh, was shorted one year on his Oakland County violent uh, Gangs and Violent Crimes Task Force uh, assignment because of his promotion. Um, but he did two years with, with the Oakland County FBI Task Force, uh, which I was talking to him the other day and probably learned the most uh, in your career in that short stint when you're dealing with nothing but violent crimes and violent criminals um, and, and investigating them. Uh, he was recently selected as a reality-based uh, training instructor as well. And uh, we're excited that Andy was promoted and brought back to us uh, as of April 1st, and he's going, again, him and Mike seem to follow each other, um, but they end up on midnights, I feel like, all the time. So I think their wives will probably tell you the same thing. So Andy, congratulations. Okay, Andy, I did not know that you worked uh, as a, a, a school resource officer, and I especially want to recognize that uh, the, the students, uh, my two sons went through Bloomfield Schools, and it really, you really make a big impact in that Appreciate role, so that. thank you for doing it. Um, please raise your right hand, repeat after me, and I'm not going to say it the same way as the other two, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're ready. <clears throat> I, Andy Racine. I, Andy Racine. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I'll support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I'll support the Constitution of the United States of America. And I'll support the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I'll support the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And, I'll, and I will faithfully discharge my duties. And I'll faithfully discharge my duties. As sergeant. As sergeant. For the Charter Township of Bloomfield Police Department. As the Charter Township of Bloomfield Police Department. The best of my ability. To my best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. Introduce my family. It's my wife Abby, my three daughters Addison, Olivia, and Emma, my brother-in-law Doug, my other brother-in-law Eric, and my sister-in-law Megan. I do have a picture you're going to want because your daughters absolutely I'm so love happy. You. Watching that was amazing. He spent many years on midnights <laughs> to help. Uh, Abby's a teacher, well, was a Waterford teacher at the time. Now, I got in Hi. Howell now. Uh, so they spent many times on midnights so that they could make that work. So um, a lot of sacrifices. But want to thank everybody for your time tonight. Um, we're excited. We're moving on to new chapters in the agency, and uh, it's going to continue for the next little while. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we do go on to our public hearing. First, we'll do the presentation part, and then after, we're going to open up the public hearing so that everybody can come up and um, let us know again if you're for or against and the information. We can, right before, yeah, we'll tell you again, but the name and address, too. So that will make it official for you. So we have our public hearing to consider confirmation of the Kirkway Area Road Paving Project Special Assessment District for number 425. And we have our uh, Director of Assessing, Darren Kretz. Here's Darren. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Everybody Seriously, leaves us. seeing the faces of those girls those looking girls. at their dad. Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> we're so that proud. Was, was so cute, right? They were like, <laughs> the one was doing thumbs up. Oh, I just kept clicking away. <laughs> 
I remember, Mr. Burris, when your kids were that little. <laughs> I remember babysitting your kids that little. <laughs> Oh, Sean, I like your construction going on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I used to babysit his room infants, and now they're like doctors, lawyers. Wow. <laughs> they have four kids themselves. All right. Thank you, Darren. You're welcome. Um, well, I guess thanks for having us tonight. A um, little background on the uh, SAD process uh, for, for some of the trustees who may not know. Um, we've we've taken over the SAD process from Olivia when she re, um, uh, when she resigned and, and took another position. So uh, we've kind of put together a little bit of a SA, SAD team here, if you will. Um, Jennifer Worthman, who's in my department, has taken on uh, a big majority of that that workload. Um, myself. Then we have Noah Mahalski in DPW, who handles kind of the DPW type questions that may arise. Um, We've got Angela and Corey out in engineering who kind of handle some of the engineering situations that pop up too. And then of course we've got Mark from uh, Mark Messler from Oakland County who's a, uh, who's a huge resource for us. Um, so with that, I guess we'll just get right into it. Um, tonight's the, uh, the hearing for SAD, Special Assessment District 425. Um, there we go. So the area that's impacted by the uh, Kirkway Road SAD, um, you'll see the following subdivisions, Island Lake Woods, Island Lake Woods number one, West Laxia, West Laxia number one, West Laxia number two and three, Island Oaks, Laxia, Kirkway subdivision, um, part of Wabeek subdivision, and then uh, certain properties that are not in subdivisions. There's a map of the um, of the boundaries of the special assessment district. Um, I believe that was all included in your your board package as well. So Kirkway Road is having 2.9 miles of uh, public roads redone. Um, the roads are Kirkway and Wood Circle, uh, part of Island Lane, Apple Lane, Blossom Lane, and Standish Court. So the scope of work, that's a snapshot I think we took, must have been last summer, I believe, um, but that's a snapshot of uh, uh, Kirkway and, and you know showing some of the areas that are in pretty desperate need of repair. Um, so the scope of work is they're, 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 they're going to be pulverizing the existing road and placing uh, new asphalt, uh, pavement of four inches thick, full width over um, the pulverized base. Uh, the exi existing curb and gutter will be removed and replaced with concrete curb and gutter. Um, they're going to do a limited amount. The county's going to be, or the uh, contractor's going to be doing a lim limited amount of drainage improvements um, to make sure that uh, you know that the, there's reasonable drainage for the pavement. Um, all the shoulders and disturbed areas will be covered with topsoil and sod. Um, you know, a maximum of five foot approach will be constructed uh, for the existing driveways to, to, to provide smooth transition from the newly paved roadway. <laughs> so um, RCOC received the bids on February 28th of this year. Um, the low bid submitted was by Allied Construction Company. The final project cost is four million seventy-three thousand six hundred thirty-five dollars and eighty cents. Um, the properties included it. There's 134 properties included in this district. So the final assessment for a full unit of benefit, which is 109 parcels, is thirty-four thousand five hundred twenty-two dollars and thirty-four cents. We have 18 half unit, um, half benefit parcels for uh, a. Per, per half unit of $17,261.17. And then we have seven parcels in the district that have zero unit of benefit. Um, so they actually, these bids actually came in 11.2% below what the, uh, the county's original cost estimate was, which is nice. Um, as always, uh, the assessments can be financed over 15 years. Uh, the interest to be determined after the bonds are sold, which is 1% over the bond rate at the time. Um, 
So the requested action would be to approve resolution number three, approve the resolution declaring in, uh, official intent to reimburse, reimburse the project expenditures with bond proceeds, and then finally to authorize RCOC to uh, proceed with the project. Any questions, comments? Some of the some of the if you have technical questions, we're probably going to bring Mark I was up for that. Say, do you want to have Mark, um, Mark Messler come on up in case? Um, so we'll start with if you have specific questions for Mark or Darren. Otherwise, we can go into public comment and then. Does anyone have any specific questions right now of of the project? Yeah. All right, then we're going to go into public comment. So if you're here for this, please come on up. And just state your name and address. This time you do have to state your address, though, because it is for the te uh, for the sure. actual SAD. <laughs> uh, I'm Bart Sandal, 1370 Kirkway Road, very the house next to the house uh, whose pavement you saw in that picture. Uh, frankly, our pavement is now worse. Uh, there are big potholes just to cross the street to get to the mailbox. So there are several good reasons for you to approve this. One is you had a spirited discussion in October. I think Mr. Shostak uh, led the opposition very spiritedly. And uh, um, eventually, I think you voted six to one, if I'm not mistaken, to approve it. Uh, secondly, uh, you recognize then and should recognize now that this was not a close poll a close voting by the community, um, there was a significant margin of support, above 50% for the community. Uh, number three, you had prom I don't know whether promise is the word, I think it's promised. I believe you promised to accept the results unless the cost came up more than 10% over budget, over estimate. It's actually 11% under estimate. Um, Number four, if you don't accept it today, you will have spent money that you will have no way of recouping. Uh, the only way you will recoup the money you already owe f to uh, RCOC is by uh, making an SAD and charging us for it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Reed Scott. I live at 3855 Kirkway. Um, I just wanted to make the comment that there are 18 parcels that are getting a 50% discount because they live on courtyard streets. And I just don't think that's fair because the courtyard streets are not going to wear out very quickly compared to the amount of traffic that Kirkway sees. If everybody paid a fair share even amount, the price per person for the 109 parcels would go from 34500 down to $32,076 per person if those discounts were removed. I just wanted to make, the, make that comment. Hi. Uh, my name is Philip Gia. Uh, I reside at uh, 3984 Columbia Drive. Um, we uh, provided uh, our you know, opinion in a letter. Um, I don't have the date because my wife was here. She presented everything. So we expressed our opinion that we are opposed. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the detail is in, in the writing. Uh, today there is no change. We still oppose it. Uh, basically, our driveway is really on the um, other side of the road. We don't use Kirkway at all. We don't drive on the Kirkway. So uh, please, you know, use the information we have provided. Uh, so uh, we still, you know, uh, oppose it. Thank you very much. And then feel free to, if you want to kind of line up, feel free. Hi, I'm Sveikane, I live at 1650 Apple Lane. Uh, in October, I uh, brought up the issue of drainage, and I know uh, you just mentioned that you're going to work with the drainage. 
Uh, but my understanding of October was that the roads will be built so it all drains into the existing collection system. Sir, can you talk into the microphone just because this goes on cable and they can't hear when you oh, step away. I'm on camera. Yeah, we're on camera. I don't want people yeah. to. <laughs> um, my understanding was that the, yeah, <laughs> uh, the, ro the road will be constructed so everything goes into the existing, existing collection system. The problem we have in, at least in some parts of that neighborhood, is that collection system doesn't hold the rain. We actually started renting gondolas last weekend. Uh, the, the upper lane became a new Venice. Uh, and it's not because the roads, it's because the collection system just can't handle the rains. Uh, so if what happens, the road themselves get degraded even more because of the constant flow of water. It just creates uh, fissures in the road. Uh, if the drainage system, which I know you told me last time, it's not us, it's Oakland County. But if one cubicle doesn't talk to the other, we're going to be redoing those roads uh, because the water is just eating them away. So it has to be part of this project. It's kind of silly that we spend $4 million and then say, oh, it looked good, but today was raining. So I don't know if there's any way to get Oakland County to look into the drainage. The capacity just doesn't hold the rain. I can project a video if you want, but I don't think you want me to do that, right? So I don't know if there's any, any change since October. And, and who, talks, who talks to who in this, in this? And again, this is just comment, but we'll have a discussion, uh, I'm sure another spirited discussion okay, afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello, I'm Tarsi uh, Scott. I live on 3855 Kirkway. Um, I actually wrote a letter last November. Um, my opinion of the assessment is totally unfair because the people that have, are paying less, supposedly, use more of the road than we do. And I think they use more of the road than a lot of the people. So it, it, they shouldn't get a discount. That's ridiculous. Plus, did they have the full vote? So then the voting might not even have been fair when this was approved. Um, that's my comment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mike Zide, 1545 Kirkway. I'm in support of the improvements. Safety is a big issue. Kirkway is a very heavily traveled bicycle route and walking route. It's a very windy road. Potholes are very bad now. They're much worse than they were back in October. Maintenance is still my concern, and I haven't heard when and how soon the road will be replaced, if this passes or when it passes. Um, but current maintenance is a big concern of mine because of the potholes and the danger that it presents for bicycles, walkers, and the cars that have to drive in the middle of the road to avoid the potholes. And it's very hard to see oncoming bicycles and or walkers. That's my comment. Is there anybody else here for the public hearing? If not, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. And then Darren and Mark, if you could come up here. Um, just to address some of these comments. So with the whether they get a half a vote or a full vote, just to remind with the township, we have two different votes that have to pass, which is one of the number of people in the assessment, uh, as well as the number of the frontage. So is right. that how it makes sure that the people who are on the road have a bigger voice? Uh, would you look at it that way? Yes, Okay. generally. You can probably give a better explanation. Well, in terms of who gets a half a person, <laughs> a half a unit as opposed to a full unit. There's no hard and fast rule. Um, generally, the assessing office, Darren, Jennifer, myself, and the engineer, uh, Olivia previously, and, and, and Angela and I, we all sit down together and try to figure out what the fairest way to do it is. Uh, a lot of people that maybe get a half unit, maybe they're on a private easement, they don't have frontage on the road, but they still use the road. Um, certainly properties that, are, that are, have their frontage on one of the roads being improved or has has direct access to one of those roads being improved, we get a full unit. There are a lot of circumstances where a property doesn't front on or even have access onto one of the roads being improved. 
but there is the opportunity somewhere in the future for them to put access through another a driveway, maybe going off to one of the roads being improved. That would be a situation where we would look at a half unit. So it, the, the, the statute doesn't specify how you determine those units other than you try to come up with an appropriate benefit based on every property's configuration, frontage on the road, uh, potential ha of having future frontage on the road. And uh, this is a very unique special assessment district because there are several very unique properties that don't fall into the, the cookie cutter yeah. formula that you would use in probably 90% of the SADs. Township in general is kind of unique because the lots are very rarely um, rectangles you know, on the, on the road being improved. So a lot goes into it. Um, we don't take it lightly. We, we take it seriously. We really try to come up with a, with a fair resolution. And it, I don't make the decision, and the assessor doesn't make the decision, the engineer doesn't. It's something that we do collaboratively, so. The next one was, um, and again, in response with that of the assessments, I know one that has come up over the years of watching these is, some would like the ones on private roads to get no assessment because they aren't on the road and then somewhat full assessment. And I, what I've seen from you kind of steadfast on the same is they may not be on the road, but they use it, Correct. but they're not getting the full also because they have to maintain and fix their road, which we don't help with. That's part we of do the, not do SADs for private roads. That's so absolutely part of the equation. Part of it is if their road fails, they do have to fully do this themselves. Correct. Um, so I remember you mentioning that as a fairness. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. Okay. I don't get to hear the way. Could you repeat that? You're absolutely correct. <laughs> I'll get that very <laughs> All right. Um, next is the uh, drainage. So we do have, there's one minor connection with Oakland County, which is what I want to mark up here. You're the road commission for Oakland County. So do you want to highlight like how, and I know you're the roads and the counties this, but do they have communications together to say, hey, we're doing this? You might want to look at the drains or with as, WRC. As far as you, WRC? You have, yes. Like yes, so uh, we do have communication with them. Uh, Pre-design, we put out and asked for any as-built, uh, you know, ask for the owners of the utilities to let us know what systems are there, size systems, et cetera, et cetera. We also pull the plats. So when the subdivisions were platted with the state of Michigan, they had uh, as-built that were already in plans that were submitted with them. So we also draw all that information. Um, we also do extensive field visits. So my staff uh, goes out and locates as much uh, utility items as they can locate. So public utility structures, drainage structures, culverts, cross culverts, anything of that nature. So um, as part of the work, as part of the scope of the work, we are rehabilitating structures. Uh, we actually are adding a couple of leach basins, leaching basins within the project. Uh, we're, relate, we're replacing cross culverts that currently uh, are deteriorated and not functioning properly. Um, and with, along with that, we're doing some minor ditching here and there. Okay. okay. So some changes. Um, we also had a question. So, can I, can yeah. I, so Mark, in saying that, you're going to then be adding, I mean, the, the concern was, I think the comment from the gentleman was um, with the past rains, and it's really the amount and the, the quickness of it is what your, um, the, the, those improvements, your thoughts are going to, to decrease that? Um, the, the to decrease it, I can't make promises that we're gonna totally resolve it. So it's also important to realize that from the Road Commission's perspective, ditches or swales, and in the course of things, it's important to realize that when subdivisions, open ditch subdivisions were originally developed, they were developed with ditches. Over time, they either get filled in during residential building projects processes or sedimentation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's important to realize that the Road Commission understands that they get filled in and it is acceptable that water sits in ditches. We understand it's going to evaporate, it's going to dissipate into the ground uh, eventually and et cetera, et cetera. We're going to do everything that we can to mitigate it. We may still have water laying in ditches. Uh, it's important to realize that the driveway culverts, so the culverts that go underneath the residential driveway, are not property of the Road Commission, they're property of the residents. A lot of those are probably deteriorated, not functioning the way that they're supposed to. 
and again, it would be astronomical in cost for us to go in and replace those culverts. And once you touch one, you basically have to touch them all to re-establish re proper drainage. Same way with the ditches, right? So there's a lot that goes into all that because now you got more pavement removal, you got the replacement of the culvert, you got uh, the driveway material, the additional driveway material for the ditching, you have the ditching that you have to do, you have the restoration that you have to do, so that cost is astronomical. So um, we're going to do everything that we can do, but with that being said, there's going to be areas that we're just not going to be able to get rid of the water maybe as quickly as a resident would like it to uh, be dissipated. The last one that we had is when uh, and how quickly will it be, if it were to pass tonight, when do you see construction starting? Uh, so we have it proposed for July. Uh, the contractor that got this contract also got six other proje SAD projects for us. Uh, Monday they start the first one, so we're trying to coordinate everything. This is a pretty extensive project and we're looking to put this project at the tail end so everything else is buttoned up and we're committed 100% to this project when we come in. So um, we're looking at July right now. Sometime in July is what we're looking at. I will tell you that it's going to go through uh, into November. Uh, we're hoping to be done by November 15th, but um, it will take the rest of the summer and into the fall for us to complete our construction. With that being said, the residents will also, two weeks prior to us starting the project, my staff will come out and uh, put letters, uh, rubber band them to mailboxes or door handles or whatever giving a my contact information uh, and when to expect that the start date is going to, the project is going to start. Okay. Do you also want the HOA president so that maybe they could help so, spread the word uh, for you? Absolutely. If that information could be passed along to me, because I can communicate a lot of things to the HOA, HOA president to keep the residents abreast of what's going on. Um, we like to be very communicative. I think it helps not only us, but it also helps the residents to understand what's taking place, especially when we go to pave the project. Uh, as I think I spoke at the last meeting, we're doing a full width paving operation now. So there's a lot of coordination that needs to take place because we're literally paving the road in one pass. Well, and then you get rid of the fear of some of us may think that that would be just a solicitation, not even open it and throw it right into the recycling. So right. that way exactly. you could still get word through yep. them as well. Yep. So I, a point person would be phenomenal. Okay. Does anyone have questions for Darren or for Mark? I had um, one clarification. If you can go back to the map in terms of the, I know there were questions about the fairness and things. And I believe this was asked at the previous meeting, but the the two the whoop, okay so on the left the fifth property where it goes too deep, the homeowner looks like it is in the next subdivision on the cul-de-sac, and yet they are being assessed a full unit. Can you just clarify how that? Or Dirk, maybe how that came about. Could some I could. I wish we could point to the property because I. Oh, I don't well, she's talking about that. Is it the out. one? Do you have the map? The, the fifth. Do you have a pointer? There's a map. Um, in the back. I can't see the yeah, number. Map in the too. It's on the left yeah. side, Dirk. It's the fifth one up. It kind of goes to too map. deep yeah, into the, back, the next the subdivision. The those are you referring to that one and then no, that, that those one, two? That one. Yep. Okay. So it, it looks like, I mean, I have done the road paving project in my own subdivision. I understand the benefit, and that over years it changes exactly yeah. how you calculate. Well, it's because but they've got... the resident, in fact, has contacted us, too, about this. Um, He's ready for you. There's two lots, and so the person that actually lives on the cul-de-sac doesn't appear to have use or benefit from Kirkway Road, and yet if their subdivision gets paved, it looks like they could actually get charged 100% for both sides, and that just doesn't seem equitable. It's just a clarification. So it's just these two parcels you're talking about, or that right. one there no, as no, well? Right, no, 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 that one, yeah. Just those two? Did you say he, what, are, he, what, are the, uh, what are the units on, on those? I, I don't know all the units by heart, so I, full. there's a lot That's of problems. A full, a full unit, the pink is all a full, 1.0. I mean, what's the unit number? Is that what you're looking No, at? I don't know. Oh, okay. So you're saying both of those got a one? Is that yes. what you're saying? 
and yet the person on the well, far left is on a cul-de-sac, which that would be their access, so would they inevitably down the road get charged? Well, certainly twice. the one that's fronting on, let's see. Yeah, uh, the, one actually on that, the, one, the one that's actually on that road there, which I cannot see. Right, not mind. that one, but the further, the, the one to the west. In the that's second one, that's also yes. that's also one unit as opposed to half. Yeah, I think that's the one, Dirk, that has that private, e that have that 20-foot easement to, that court. they can... Okay. They have a drive. Is, is that the one that put the driveway off? They have an access court? there. Yeah. Oh, I yes. believe that's Somebody the one. Somebody put access yep. under the And And that's the yeah. reason. That's yeah. So that actually is why I used to fight your hole, they might right. do it someday, and then someone did it. <laughs> so um, so that actually, yeah. If it has direct access, that's the reason. They have I, a I actually drove court on by the it. Backyard, and they have actually put in a driveway. a driveway access to get out and in from the sports court. So what would happen because they're included in this? They would, and I shouldn't speak out of school, but they would right. not be included in the district where they were no. doing the call to set. They would oh, not. So they would not get double. They would not be right. specially assessed win. twice. No. Okay, because I tried to understand that. I know we we no. looked at this, and I I asked that last fall. I actually drove by there tonight on my way to the meeting. Just try to do my own homework. Yeah. Drove down the street. Those roads are in terrible shape. And as someone who did this in my own subdivision, um, you know, I can see the need. And also for the to come in 11 percent under is a, a real positive outcome for this project. Yeah. Was actually I actually looked that. at that twice <laughs> to make sure. Well, I couldn't. Was, I haven't seen under in so long that I was like, is that is that correct? <laughs> yeah, under. Well, this all our other ones came in nine percent and. Uh, Eight to nine percent over. So right. Yeah. So That's this was a pleasant surprise. Yeah. That was a pleasant. So those were the questions for that. Do you have any questions? Anybody? I just have comments. I don't have a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I my issue with this uh, SAD from last time is strictly about the allocation of the units. Um, I'm fully in favor of, of the SAD. I note that sixty one percent. Uh, the parcel owner signed the petition, 61% of the road frontage signed the petition, uh, which is generally higher than we see uh, for these types of things. Um, so my issue has always been with the allocation of the units. Um, Dirk and I talked at length today. Um, so it's, I'm in a bit of a conflicted position because I want to support the SAD, but I don't like the way that the units were allocated. Um, so I'm just making that comment. There's no other comments. I'd look for a motion. I'd be happy to make the motion. Motion by Trustee Barnett. Support. Support by Treasurer Keeps. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. One. Sorry. So we do. Do we do a roll call? We usually have a lot of seven, and or you got that. Well, I think we. Is. I don't think you need. We got. It. We got. It. Okay. We, know, we know who it is. <laughs> Legally, I was though. like, whoa. <laughs> All right. So confusion. So six to one. Yeah. All right, that does pass. Thank you, and to uh, thank you also for showing. There we go. So next we have um, considering the award of the solid waste program contract, and we have Noah Mahalski, our director of DPW. Um, the, the agenda that we got given out says that number five is the water rates. Oh, did it get but up, but up there did it it's get changed? I don't know. Oh, I, yeah. They're not consistent. They're not so. consistent. Mine says solid waste program. Mine says solid waste, but yours says, says water. Mine this says was water what, what was on my <laughs> Oh, I believe it. Yeah. Well, um, which one would you like to go first? <laughs> yeah. it's like April. Let's just do solid waste. Okay. We've okay. already sorry. announced it, and people are here for it. He knew so let's that do we're that. That's fine. Okay. Especially because then they can hear oh, yeah, it's, 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 every, everything else that wasn't like covered air conditioning. in other It's all waste. Just, just want to point that out. I don't know if, the, don't know if like the back there says the same yeah, thing. No, I have one of each, to be honest. <laughs> right, so do I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So the ones back there are not consistent. Okay. So just They have them reversed. But considering that mo a lot of our comments I, were for that, it's I'd fine. I'd stick with that one. So no, if He's you want to. He's getting the Zoom ready. Okay. And then if you want, you can go first, and we'll have the selection committee people each kind of discuss what they what they okay. did. We can cover all the uh, all the other things that haven't been mentioned yet. <laughs> Zoom. I plan to cover everything. Yeah. yeah. Can you highlight <laughs> that? Um, can you highlight so, like I have the seven reasons of why we actually did choose it? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> None of which we have been mentioned yet, but. Who's on Zoom? That is one good thing about social media. When people took time to write in today, it was nice to actually have the conversations 
they heard all the things that were actually part of the decision so that's so who's going to be on zoom i'm not clear this is raf tell us for the second one that's for the ready for the water rate one. Oh, okay so now we're again so you, going back you, in you can sit there <laughs> which agenda so they had hand. them ready but now we're putting uh, them on no, hold so we can go to the, the next presentation we're not doing what uh, it's uh it's solid waste correct yeah just making sure giving you the right one I got you. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to fight you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, never mind. Okay. All right. Good evening. Uh, we're going to run through the solid waste contract that we recently went out for bid for. Um, Kind of wanted to give you an overview of the community just to kind of frame things um, and this contract. 16,000 residential homes within the township, 83% of them are single family with 17% multifamily like apartment type homes. Uh, contract covers curbside, door side, inside pickup. Commercial is not included as part of the uh, contract. Uh, events were a priority for the community and uh, solidifying the household hazardous waste and e-waste events as part of the contract. Plus just a note that we're a larger than average um, uh, yard waste generator uh, as you might be able to tell based on the larger lot size and that type of stuff that we have. Um, so our, our kind of evaluation focuses on single family, multifamily homes. Again, that's what our, our makeup is. Um, same dates, um, discounts, uh, and the same program we spec'd out as part of the specking process. So a um, little history on the contract. 1991, an ordinance was enacted to codify and kind of consolidate services. Before that time, each resident contracted separately for their own service. So you had multiple haulers coming down our roads and any given day or week, you would have multiple haulers servicing our community. So that resulted in noise, road damage, that type of thing. So in 1991, uh, well, an ordinance was enacted giving the authority to facilitate the contract on the DPW side. Um, 1991 city disposal which no longer exists was awarded the first contract. 99 that contract was then awarded to waste management. It was rebid in 2007 and awarded to Rizzo Services who became GFL. Um, there were some buyouts and some contract extensions that I kind of note there as well through that process. Um, so bidding process, so I will say GFL's in the audience, so is Todd Stamper, the CEO of uh, Priority Waste GFL. Um, it has representatives here in the audience. We have a good relationship with GFL. We negotiated and tried to do an extension with them, uh, and I would say extension negotiations took place. We had multiple proposals and revisions that were taken in, reviewed by the staff, and then a final decision was made to bid out that contract. Uh, again, our staff, uh, Katie, has been through multiple of these solid waste contracts for the DPW uh, and a switch of hauler as well, um, but she brought that experience and we updated the kind of RFP to fit the kind of new paradigm since we haven't been out to bid in 16 years. We wanted to make sure we captured everything that's occurred during that period. Uh, so we did that, the RFP was part of the, um, the packet for you guys. Um, then we received four bids in in response to that RFP. Um, you know, when I say GFL's been a good good uh, partner, they did hold their pricing for that 16 year period. They did step up during COVID and you know, the community that I'm in was skipping uh, some days. Now that was not priority, it was another uh, hauler in the business, but there were people skipping days out there due to staff issues and, and kind of all the other issues that we all dealt with with COVID. Um, and storm response, even in the uh, recent storm, they kind of stepped to the plate to, uh, to handle that for us. So I can't kind of gloss over that, um, the, the effective relationship and the good relationship that we've had. Um, 
So then we kind of want to rest assured we're going out to bid for the same program that we've had uh, here in Bloomfield Township, right? And then we've allowed the bidders to um, come in with their, um, you know, exceptions to the bid, right? And so that's where the kind of the proofs in the pudding, that's where we get new inventive things that come out of this contract. Um, so really it was, but the main focus was don't change the service level that we're expecting out of this service contractor. So the RFP uh, includes all the same things that we've had in the past. Uh, no restrictions on the amount of yard waste, solid waste, recycling, um, all the discounts that we love in Bloomfield Township, all of the days, the route scheduling, all that will remain the same. Um, quarterly billing remain the same, all these kind of things that were part of our snowbird program, they maybe were unique things to Bloomfield Township because of the makeup that we have, all those things will not change. Um, and additionally, um, in this case, priority, we've had a lot of questions about the size of containers. Uh, so the 95 gallon containers are allowed through the contract. They have the ability to tip them. They were not allowed in the GFL contract, but GFL stepped up to the plate and they were taking those bins. So even though they weren't allowed in the last contract, they were being picked up and they are allowed as part of this contract. What we So that's a cart plus paradigm where you have a cart and then you can put additional material out. What we didn't feel that the township was ready for was a cart only paradigm which is way the industry's going and we'll eventually have to go there but that's a situation where you can only fill the cart and then any additionals on top of that you're going to be paying extra for right so this is um and you can have multiple carts and that type of stuff we didn't feel like we were ready to go to a cart uh paradigm out there um uh and they do uh priority is going to offer the uh the um the uh, carts for sale at a discount from what I've been able to see them at online and that type of stuff. So, so as part of the bid process, it was important that we're comparing apples to apples in this, focus on the differences and the exceptions. Um, we knew a price, like based on negotiations in the market out there, we knew a price increase was coming. So staff kind of focused on yeah, we're gonna pay more, but what type of services can we get extra as part of this contract? Um, so level of service and discounts became kind of paramount. Um, recognizing again as well that um, the art of picking up trash hasn't changed much in the industry, right? So the kind of proof in the pudding comes down to those intangibles, timing, follow through, conflict resolution, customer service, the main key kind of tenants. And we're in a unique position in the DPW because we hear all the complaints. Um, so I can tell you that there were complaints over the years, whether it be with billing, whether it be with follow-up, there were complaints. So, um, and again, leaning on the kind of experience of staff members to, to flesh out those things. So some new options were written into the contract too, some kind of must-haves that we wanted out there. Um, one is we know that the events are popular. We know that due to budget constraints, we were having to cut those projects in previous years. So we wanted to make them part of the solid waste contract to give continuity to that contract. Um, so that includes an e-waste event and a fall hazardous waste event. So those will be guaranteed to happen throughout the life of the contract. Um, also, kind of facilitating this move to the rolling trash carts, right, in a, in a kind of non-aggressive way to say, hey, they're available, right, and then we'll start to get to see numbers on who's really requesting these things, if they have cart plus type material out there, and we can start looking at the um, kind of makeup of our customer base to see when we want to go to that switch, and yeah. if. And they are allowed to those stay though at 35 and the 32. Oh yeah, the smaller ones you can always put out there. The, the trucks are equipped to handle both types, right? So we weren't ready to make that move where you have to have Correct. the cart because that's the next step in this type of thing. Right. 
Uh, so again, stability of event offerings, foster that transition over to carts, and then pricing for alternatives to kind of, so we can discuss whatever those alternatives want. Additionally, um, you know, there's uh, provisions within the contract, which is included as well, that no like fuel surcharges or tipping fees or that type of stuff can kind of be added in um, during the term of the contract. So. It's important when you start looking at these uh, contracts, and I know some of the numbers were stated out there, but this is an eight-year contract cost, so this is not a yearly cost. We wanted to give you an idea over the life cycle of this eight-year contract what we're looking at for as far as costs, right? So you see the numbers down there at the bottom. Um, and additionally, I'll touch on a couple people that we did not evaluate. Um, so. There were four bidders and we only really evaluated two of those bidders. One of the bidders was Titan National. They're a new player on the, on the block. They really have no municipal contracts and they have a lot of experience from their senior management style uh, and there were some of the people who are, are, have the Rizzo name so they have a trash background um, but they don't have any experience currently with any other municipal contracts to speak of and, and in particular they had a reference letter from my old boss in there from 2012 kind of indicating we were still a customer of them so um, not uh, not true. <laughs> so, uh, waste management, um, we were excited about waste management to come in, you know, we were concerned that we would go out to bid and there would be no bidders, right, and the way you end up with a better price in the bidding environment is competition, so we were very concerned that there would be no competition out there, so we had meetings with waste management with prospective bidders ahead of time to just see, hey, are you guys gonna, waste management has kind of been removing themselves from this part of the um, trash hauling game because they want to really have a cart, a cart only type service, so, They've priced it that way, and if you're not willing to go that way, they're kind of saying, well, you're off our market, right? So you see that in their pricing, not really competitive. We were hopeful they would bring in some new widgets and new, you know, uh, waste management has a lot of clout and a lot of, they're a big company, so they have a lot of research and a lot of app, a lot of tech-friendly stuff behind them because they can develop that stuff. So we were excited to see what they'd come in with and that kind of fell flat on us. So, um, so then kind of into the actual evaluation process. Um, so we formed a committee. Um, of three trustees and then our three DPW staff management people. Um, we wanted to A, share the load in the vetting process, which was extensive, um, and we wanted to get you know multiple people's take on all these kind of vetting processes that we went through. And I'll kind of kind of run through that, but we checked all their references extensive phone conversations, visits with the people, um, interviews with Priority Waste and GFL, uh, did a site visit at Priority Waste, and then cash rules, right, a comparison of the rates. So, uh, addition to that, background checks were completed, um, extreme vetting of the references, particularly Flint, um, the superintendent of public works had an hour plus long conversation with the um, waste hauler or waste manager from the city of Flint and priority came in there in a situation where their other trash hauler kind of left them flat. They came in there and kind of cleaned up things in Flint, uh, which they did on their own accord and they felt like they kind of had to have a good start there. Um, so nothing but rave reviews. Also we called Gross Eel. Uh, we figure they're demographically very similar to Bloomfield Township and they have a, uh, you know, a similar clientele, uh, resident base. And so we wanted to understand how happy they were with services. Very glowing reviews. Uh, Westland, the mayor of Westland, um, very pragmatic. He said, you know, started off talking about all the positives, and there are large, a lot of pickups in Westland, which you'll see the numbers a little bit later. But then he, you know, kind of reframed it and said, well, hey, I got to give you some 
negatives too, right? And that's when all the growing pain type comments and, and things like that came out. So what I, the feeling there is, is that it's a partnership. Any issues, if they've arisen, have been, uh, you know, handled very quickly. So, um, and again, we want to focus again on the levels of service, the customer experience with these type of things. Um, so GFL, <coughs> again, they've done an excellent job within the township. We're not saying that, right? Um, we're saying anything other than that. Um, servicing the residents, handling customer service, they could provide this same level of service, right? But what we're looking for is if we're gonna pay more, we need to get more out of that contract, right? So a um, couple things, discounts, a little different, but relatively the same. Uh, GFL kind of came in with two bids. One was a lower price increase up front, and then a little bit more over the life versus a little bit more increase up front and then flatten it out and hold it through the life, right? So that's the difference, and we'll break that down uh, a little bit later. Um, then you get into priority waste. So they do meet the parameters of our bidding. Um, they bill themselves as a tech company in the waste industry, and I'll dovetail into why that's important, um, both from an accountability and a liability standpoint. Additionally, a uh, couple of, including the CEO, a couple of people um, in the management uh, of priority waste are township residents. So we believe that is a benefit to the community as well. Uh, you see a litany of the um, uh, communities that they service. Uh, a couple that I mentioned, Westland, Grosseal, Flint, that type of thing are in there. A um, little bit more into the let, so this gives you some size and scale of what they're dealing with out there. Um, Westland, 30,000 pickups, right? You can start to see the size and scale. Flint, very large city, 30,000 pickups. Um, varying lengths of contracts, that type of stuff. You can see what their kind of pedigree is out there with the communities they're servicing, right? Then I talked about the technology side of it and the customer service side. Um, and I will mention on this last slide too, they also picked up the Mid-Michigan Mid Waste um, Authority formed recently and they got about half of that contract and that involves like Saginaw area communities up there got into a consortium, put out a bid for services and they won half that contract. So um, just size and scale of their operation and preparedness to kind of um, ability to perform display in that. So. All right, so customer service became a huge focus uh, for the determination here. Again, the, we're, we believe and we will make sure as a staff that trash will get picked up, right? So we'll make sure that happens. That's part of the contract. There's multiple provisions within the contract for that. So then it came down to level of service, customer service, all those things became the huge focus, right? Um, key drivers for that is the technology that they have in place with their vehicles and with their management style. Um, what do I mean by that? <coughs> they have technology that allows their kind of middle level management to kind of be there with the driver, right? And they see multiple benefits. One is this industry, it's a difficult job. Um, and so there's a lot of turnover within the industry, right? And if the driver can have an advocate for them out there on the site, which is a middle level manager, help them through any kind of issue they may come up with or they may come across on the um, site or an issue they may be dealing with personally for mental health reasons, these people are in place to help them work through those issues, right? Um, their LDCs, logistical driver coordinators, are those people that act as that liaison between the driver and the community or the customer, right? Uh, we heard about the cameras. Um, this is a distinguishing factor. There are not cameras on all equipment out there. Um, and again, there's a kind of twofold benefit to the community, limiting liability from our standpoint as the township and the contractor. And additionally, um, you know, um, we can accountability for the provider. Because currently, if we have a complaint, let's say, come into the DPW about commingling, recycling, and waste, and other refuse, right? We have to go on faith that 
a representative from GFL is going to call down and investigate what happened with that truck, right? And then we either have to go on faith or we have to stake out that truck because there are no uh, avenues at this point to 100% confirm what went into the truck, right? That's eliminated with this type of system. Additionally, um, we had an incident with an explosive device being put in a um, waste hauler vehicle um, and there was investigations, there was all issues that resulted from that having cameras on the site would have prevented a lot of that or at least got us to the point where we knew where the explosive device came from you know by the time we were down the road and it blew up um, so um, those are kind of extreme examples but they're examples nonetheless um, secondarily there's accountability to the system one of those ways accountability they're adding AI so they can tell how clean the recyclables are right there's no real market for recyclables out there it's being created it ebbs and flows with the economy right so the ultimate driver is for them to make sure that the recyclables are very clean when they come into them they come into a processing facility and it's a single stream facility you literally have machines blowing garbage and waste out of it or you have humans picking out the contaminants right and the cleaner they can be with recycling the more value they can get out of it, right? So they're, ha they're developing software that'll take video of the material as it's going into the truck, and it will tell them whether, oh, somebody's putting a lot of plastic bags in, right? And those are prohibited because they gum up the works. So accountability there. Additionally, if we, um, it will allow for some gentle persuasion to follow the rules. Um, you know, uh, it will have, a, right now if we have a complaint about missed garbage, we don't know, we have to go on faith, right? There's no tracking of the vehicle, we can't pin it down to, oh, they were here at 645, or 645 would be before 7, 745, right, and it wasn't out. Or um, the story we've heard from Priority, somebody put a white bag out on a snow hill, the guy missed it, right, because it was basically camouflaged on the snow hill. They said, yep, there it is. And, and in all cases, they will go back to pick it up, but they will try to educate the homeowner, hey, you know, this is the proper stuff you're supposed to be putting in there. This is, you know, these are the reasons why. And they will try to educate the uh, resident multiple times. So we got, you know, we want to make sure they're not going to be like, yeah, hey, you broke the rules, it's going to sit here, right? That's not the paradigm that we're, we're trying to set up. Real-time monitoring of the route, too. We don't rely on humans to relay that back to us. We can kind of take a look at that, and eventually they'll be able to get this data, so you'll be able to go on there and say, hey, it's coming down the road. I better get it out, right? Where I live, I can hear the truck going around my neighborhood, so I know it's time to get up and take the stuff out. So, um, <coughs> so really, that additional monitoring is for the QA, QC side of things, accountability and customer education. Uh, here's the overall rate comparisons, right? So I boiled the first slide, boiled the eight years down to a total price. Uh, this one just shows you what the rates proposed are for each given year. And again, there are the two contractors that we um, did not eliminate from contention. Uh, another way to look at this, this includes all the bidders here, but the green line is priority in every case, in every type of service level that we provide, they are the lowest bidder. Um, and, you know, the lowest qualified bidder, because again, we can't, uh, the, the other company basically got eliminated by their lack of experience. But this just shows you across all those service parameters what the pricing is that we got. So a little bit about the transition period, right? Because we're all concerned about this. This is not a, um, something we take lightly to make a change at any change after 16 years is a difficult one right so data sharing is going to be critical staff facilitation of that um, is going to be critical as well we have multiple i think i stopped counting at like 15 contract language parameters that could drive this transition period right and things we could do from liquidated damages to just all out you know stop and pan, right? So there's several 20 or 30 different 
contract parameters or RFP language that could be applied to make this a smooth transition. We do not think that we're going to have to do all that, right? We're going to, we're ready, prepared in case we do, but we believe they're going to play nice in the sandbox. So um, there is a good relationship between the two, as good as it can be for being competitors. They all understand that, you know, there's some um, benefits to playing nice in the sandbox. So, um, and again, within that, there's kind of provisions to make sure that we don't have any kind of gotcha fees that pop up throughout this, uh, this contract as well. Um, so I'm re recommending tonight that we award the solid waste contract to priority waste. Um, I did include a draft contract that, you know, there's going to be, uh, I want authorization for Danny to sign that draft contract, understanding we still have to negotiate um, with, G or with priority waste at this time. So. Um, Not negotiating, probably, you mean the contract language of like with Dirk? Yeah, well, he's reviewed the draft contract language, but we have to go to the table and sit so with sure Priority Waste and make sure it's acceptable to him, right? But we couldn't okay. do that until we had authorization from you guys to go forward with that. Okay. So. And we did incorporate, Dirk did yeoman's work for us and did incorporate all of the language that was part of our extensions, part of our switching from uh, when uh, Rizzo was bought out by a couple other investment firms and became GFL, we included any contract parameter that was in for those contracts as well. So anything we've learned over the last 16 years is in there, but it is subject to negotiation with us. Do you want to start with the committee members giving your experience, and then we can have. You know, I actually questions. want to make yeah. make a statement or slash disclosure. So I, it, just so that for, it, it, it's everyone knows, I have a nephew that works for GFL. <laughs> um, okay. I don't think that's a conflict in any way, but but um, you know, I have a family member who's a nephew. No. Are you sure? Yeah. So. Okay. All right. But right. But know. thank you. Um. So. Sure. So um, I was um, asked by Supervisor Walsh to be part of this committee to meet with the waste haulers and I welcome that opportunity and I'm happy to share with you why I am in support of um, Noah's recommendation for us to go ahead with priority waste. So I've heard a lot of the concerns from township residents and uh, similar to what they found through their internet searches with Dearborn Heights, I also found the same thing. So I did my due diligence. I have um, contacts with elected officials in Dearborn Heights and I spoke to three different elected officials there. And all three of them told me unequivocally without hesitation, if they had to go back um, to switch from GFL to priority waste, they would stick with their decision to go with priority waste, even in light of the fact that they had some hiccups and um, as Noah termed it, some growing pains. So just a little bit um, of background of what I learned after speaking with the Dearborn Heights officials, they had sort of two unique things happening at the time that the switch occurred. So first, the prior waste hauler did not share the routes with Priority Waste after they took over. So that was one issue that Priority Waste had to overcome as far as making sure that they um, knew all of the addresses and all the locations and having a route that made sense to service those people properly. Um, in addition to not having those routes, there was the uh, torrential uh, downpour and so a lot of homes in Dearborn Heights were flooded. That resulted in a lot of excess trash and as we heard we've had experience here with GFL when we have excess trash they pick it up. Um, my understanding from speaking with officials is that it wasn't just a matter of having this excess trash but they learned that many of their residents were in fact bringing waste from other locations to their home and so that exacerbated the additional waste that priority had to um, have to haul away. So I believe that we will, you know, the township is not going to have those same growing pains. One, I have no doubt that priority waste is going to pick up whatever waste residents leave at the curb. Um, additionally, 
We've been told by Priority Ways that if they are granted this uh, contract, they will do dry runs in the township. So before July, they will have trucks on the road running through, um, establishing the routes and making sure that they know all of the houses that need to be serviced, all of the private roads, um, whatever uh, logistical circumstances they may uh, encounter will be ironed out before the start of the contract and I think that that speaks to um, the dedication that Priority Waste has. Uh, one other thing that really resonated with me when I was talking to um, the official in Dearborn Heights, he mentioned to me that when the issues were on the ground happening in Dearborn Heights, the owner of the company, Mr. Samper, who, who is here with us this evening, was in the truck on the ground with his employees going throughout the city to try and determine you know, what's going on, what are the problems, why aren't we able to respond to the waste that we have out on the street. And that really spoke volumes to me because you have an individual who is problem solving. So sure, maybe you're not gonna get it right 100% of the time, but if you are willing to face the problem head on and find a solution to that problem quickly, I think that that is uh, certainly a reason to um, award that contract. And we heard even from NOAA, they had issues in Flint. Flint didn't have their waste picked up, I think it was for two or three weeks prior to uh, Priority taking on their contract. So. Priority technically under the contract was not responsible for that waste that was left behind. But, you know, what are they going to do? Say, okay, this is two, three weeks old, we're going to leave it and just pick up the new garbage? No, that's not what they did. They went, they got additional trucks, they made a point to pick up all of that excess waste, and again, that went above and beyond their contract, and frankly, they did not have to do that. But that, to me, speaks of a level of customer service. So when we think about Bloomfield Township and what our residents expect, and as a board, we want to provide the highest level of service to our township residents. And yes, GFL has um, done what they promised to do, but there has been, there, we have received complaints, and myself personally, when I have had an issue with GFL, there's either a, a very long wait time on the phone or you can't get somebody on the phone. You have to leave a voicemail message and wait for somebody to respond to you. When you are thinking of Bloomfield Township, that's not necessarily the level of service that we expect. With Priority Waste, we are going to have a dedicated phone line for township residents. So if a resident has an issue, they're gonna get on the phone, they're gonna get somebody to answer that phone within a reasonable amount of time and have that address or, and have that issue addressed. Um, part of addressing the issue does also come down to seeing what's happening on the road. So instead of having to wait to have somebody follow the truck the next week out and see if it's the homeowner um, not leaving it out or if there's an issue with the bin and uh, some, some issue with the driver, that's something that we're gonna be able to see in real time. Um, even with the, the logistics um, coordinator that they have, Noah mentioned um, the story of the white bag on the snow pile. So that's not a problem for the resident, right? Because they can just leave their white garbage bag out. Well, with that logistics coordinator, now the driver is going to have a reminder from them, hey, this is the house that they left the white bag, so keep a lookout. That's a great, you know, as somebody who is um, in, a, in a stressful job, having to deal with waste day after day after day, now they're, they have some backup. They have somebody to remind them of a potential issue that they faced in the past so that it's not repeated again. So um, I will, you know, I, I'm sure that other people have a lot to say, but I feel confident that Priority Waste is going to provide the level of service that our residents expect. And I don't believe that we will have any of the issues that um, Dearborn Heights faced with, with Priority. And I am also, um, you know, part of why I'm so confident in this is because the owner of this company is a township resident. He's invested in our township, and I have no doubt that he will do whatever needs to be done to make sure that we have the level of service that we expect. So a, a great summary, Stephanie, thank you. And, and um, I, I think you know one of the things I guess that I wanna to speak to first and foremost 
is the thoroughness and the vetting of the process because I think um, uh, Danny, myself, Stephanie, staff um, have spent a lot of time. We all really do have different vantage points. Um, um, Katie has been involved with the original Rizzo contract. Um, then again with the GFL assumption of that with extensions, um, Noah has and, and really the transition from waste management to to Rizzo. So she's been through a couple changes. Um, more importantly, um, Katie gets a lot of the calls, so she has to deal with it if there's problems. Which which, you know, to me having been through the process and then being the one who has to um, represent the, the residents when there's a problem, um, the responsiveness, the cooperation. Um, is is important. Um, I, I think it's important to say, and 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 we we've had. I had the opportunity um, actually when um, GFL purchased Rizzo um, to meet the the founder and CEO of of GFL. I met at that time also the CFO, um, the executive vice president. So I've I, I've had the opportunity to meet um, the head of, the heads of, of GFL. We've had the opportunity to work with some of their staff for, I've been on the board since 09, um, and have, you know, we've had different variations of this contract, extensions, and so I've lived through that, and, and mm -hmm. quite frankly, I, you know, I, I think GFL has been a very good provider for us. Um, the issue, I guess, is really going forward, um, you know, how, how can we do what's best for the township? Um, I very much, um, I think value, loyalty, and continuity. So our, our relationship is, is very important to me. Um, I, I think that you know the reality is we have 16,000 pickups a week. Um, you know, we, if it hasn't been said once or twice, I'm going to say it again. Um, waste removal is extremely important to every single resident in this community. And I've asked a lot of residents about it, and they say, well, it's not an issue. Why do we care? Well, it's not an issue because GFL has been doing a good job, and it hasn't been an issue for them. However, for the ones that have had an issue um, getting, dealing with GFL, getting a return call, um, promptness is an issue, and it's frustrating. And, and maybe... You know, 16 years ago, 10 years ago, that may not that may have been acceptable. Today, with with computers and instant everything, people really do expect a, an instant answer, um, and and it's to a certain degree it is a, a little bit of a different day and age, and priority does address that in, in a different way than GFL currently is. Um, the reality is, with 16,000 um, pickups a week. You know, expect that there's going to be at least one percent where there's issues. So, out of those 160, the issue isn't that there's 160. Really, the issue is, um, you know, how quickly can they resolve them? Um, and if they're not resolved quickly, they fester. And 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 as administration, we see that those emails come in. We we I don't see it all as much as as Katie may, and um, but but clearly we do see it. Um, you know. I think it should be pointed out clearly that priority is less than GFL. So that has to be a factor. Although I, I would suggest that from my standpoint, it, it isn't a determinant, um, but it clearly is a factor. Um, you know, one of, I think, the things that impressed me um, when we met with, with the executive team from uh, priority was um, when we were talking about um, why the Stampers moved to Bloomfield Township and why this is important to him. And he said, you know, it's important to me because I live here and I'd like to have the contract. He goes, but what's really important to me, and he kind of said this jokingly, but I, I'm married and I, and I believe it. He said, when I come home, um, I don't want to hear from my wife that there's bad service or that some of the residents are upset. So to, to me, that goes a long way. But really, what, what makes, you know, and I, and I am still kind of open, but I'm really inclined to support the priority. But our staff recommendation. Again, our staff is is supportive of this. They're the ones that have to work with it. Um, you know, Noah and Katie on a daily basis, and they know the the quote unquote pain of transition because um, they've lived through it, and it's not easy. Um, so I, I I'm inclined um, to support priority, but I guess I, I do want to hear the rest of the board. Good thing about going last is you guys said a lot of the stuff already, so mine will be a little quicker. Um, 
So being here for 51 years, this is literally where the only place I've truly lived, uh, born and raised. So my expectations are probably higher than most because I didn't come from somewhere here. I literally only know Bloomfield Hills expect Bloomfield Township expectations. Um, so it, it, whether it's from the start to the finish, taking away services, and I know some might think it's about cameras. Just you know, there are cameras on some of the GFL trucks. They use it more in a um, a punitive matter uh, based on it's aimed at the drivers to make sure, do you have your seatbelt on this? And that makes sense for safety, that makes sense for insurance, but that's all they view these cameras for. When somebody outside of the industry sees, well, I already have cameras, how can I use it for other things? So it's not just because there's cameras on a, on a truck. I would hope that everybody knows everybody up here is not that kind of, hey, look at this flashy thing over here. That is obviously not why anybody would pick a $33 million contract. But when you do have an expectation of, I sat here and watched everybody, was very upset in 2019 when house health hazardous waste went away. So when you have two different options, and one says to you, I'm gonna support these two, and one says, I'm sorry, it's, it's, we don't want that. So just to start from the beginning, we did not plan to go to bed. We assumed GFL would be, as a partner for 16 years, actually they've only, been part of us for a little while, but Rizzo GFL as a whole, 16 years, that they would come ready to be a partner. Um, so the reason it took a little while is because actually nobody from their executives ever showed up. Um, so although I really respect Don, who is our middle manager that we deal with, um, that is all that they sent. So you can't really negotiate when non-decision makers are in the room. So it took a lot longer with them because they never actually sent a decision maker on an almost $40 million contract. Uh, whereas with the others, priority, we had the CFO, the CEO, CEO, and the vice president all sitting there ready to go. So you didn't need as many meetings because decision makers are sitting in front of your face. Um, so that kind of helped in a sense of realizing they get it. Not only are they on the trucks as their senior management, they show up because they know things move faster when you're there to make decisions. So after, what, six months of trying to get a better bid, Noah, was it six months? It was about five, six times that we kept saying, please, give us something better. Extensive negotiation. Yeah, the first one was taking away bulk. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was coming out. So let's just be real honest. Things were coming out and your price was going up. So after a while, we negotiated it where you were only losing some services, but still prices are going up. Then you have somebody who offers you every service and more. You have to listen. So uh, the big reasons for me that I started to see is I do get the complaints as well because people know me. I lived here 51 years. I've either taught their kids Sunday school, I see them all around, I went to school with their kids. So if they don't get an answer from GFL, which after 45 minutes sitting online or waiting two weeks to get a call back, they would contact Katie, no and I. So you do see the complaints and they're valid complaints out there. If somebody takes five straight weeks trying to fix the same problem, that's frustrating for them. So to those of us that didn't have a problem, it's great. But if you can't fix a problem in five weeks, that's a bigger problem. So we will be able to immediately fix things because we will have real time. Um, the other thing obviously was protecting the hazardous waste days and the shredding days. Um, so with priority, we'll have both. Uh, the other thing that a constant complaint is, we always want it all. Let's be realistic, we're Bloomfield Township, we expect it all. We expect if we want small, you're taking our small one. If we want medium, you're taking our medium. And if we want big, you're taking our big. There was one, one company that can do that for us right now at a better price. Um, the others, like all big, all small. Um, and then the other issue too with that is they knew it was coming. They've known for years that household hazardous waste and larger carts, they could have prepared. It takes about two years to get these trucks. That shows a level of importance to, of what we are to these people. You have a brand new company that didn't know if they'd get us, they ordered the trucks so that they'd be ready to take your small, your medium, and your big. You have another company who's your partner who still didn't get ready. That's a problem. You also have a partner who knows that dedicated people are who we expect. We expect not to sit 45 minutes on a line. We expect that when we have paid for eight years for a dedicated line, by the way, that is included in our current contract, if you've ever called, you know it doesn't exist. So although it was in our current contract, it's, it's again was mentioned, it's not available. So as somebody who just kind of sat there and watched that we were getting the same bid of we'll have this, this, and we've never gotten it, 
there is a point where you have to say, and I was a BlackBerry girl, so I get it. Change is hard. I had my BlackBerry when the iPhone came out. I thought, what is all this fas flashy technology? It's never going to work. Never leave my BlackBerry. So I get it. But I kind of look at this as waste management and GFL, they're amazing at what they do to, d it, to what they expect of today's expectations. As expectations change, they're not evolving as quickly as their competitors. And you have competitors coming in, and yes, technology does matter. Because as a person who, um, who has to give you answers right away, I can't wait two to five weeks. I need you to get your services up and running faster. So Katie gets it a lot more than I do. Noah gets it a little bit less, and then I get it. And if it's gotten to me, if I'm still only getting to talk to middle management to get things fixed, and he's retiring, by the way, <laughs> he retires in less than a year, who am I supposed to reach out to next to get your services taken care of? That's a big deal. When now I can go to senior management and say, go fix it, and they will. So for me, I have very high expectations, and I'm not going to lower my expectations after 51 years of living here. Um, it wasn't price for me, it was lesser services. Um, so the fact that it's more services and it's uh, less expensive, that just seemed like an obvious no-brainer. Some have said it's just a few dollars. I'm glad you put those numbers up there. It is four to five million dollars difference. This isn't a little bit of a difference. This is a four to five million, dif four to five million dollar difference between priority and GFL, if I read that correctly. It's four, four, right around four million. Four, to four yep. million. So this isn't a few dollars. This is a significant change. And again, you won't have the same services you have. And I know how do you pick? Which one do you want to lose? Household hazardous waste or e shredding and, and that? And these are things we expect. Um, the bulk, being able to put it out there whenever we want, I don't want that going away. I want to be able to put a mattress out there when I get a new mattress. These are things I expect, and these are things that we'll be able to keep. So for me, it was keeping our services, and I was just happy that we got even better services. But it was, don't take away anything that we have. And that was what my decision was based off of. I don't know if anybody has questions for Noah and Katie is in the back. I, she's hiding, but I, think I know I, she's there. <laughs> I, um, I communicated with Noah and Stephanie ahead of this meeting because I was not on the committee, so I read the packet and had questions of my own. Being here during the transition with GFL, um, there were some hiccups and things they, that got worked through, but um, personally I thought they did a really good job and I was hearing a lot of things. In fact, I even had a resident come up my front walk and knock on my door to talk to me about it today. So I wanted to not wait till the meeting. Noah will give us obviously more information at a meeting, but I wanted to do my homework. So I went online, I looked at reviews, I talked to um, Trustee Fakie because I knew she'd been on the committee. I was able to reach her. I reached out to uh, Noah and asked the questions that I had. One of them was that the, the large bin wasn't in there. And I know that residents paid for those bins. Those weren't free. And that's something that we've all gotten used to, those that have them. And that would have been, if, you know, was that not in the contract? Well, it turns out it wasn't listed in that contract, but Noah clarified for me. Stephanie told me about her experience with the meetings. Um, I have had great service from GFL, but I've also been one of the people that have called and can't reach anybody, can't ask a question about my bill, just send my bill in and figure my own senior discount because my husband's older than I am. Um, you know, things like that where you can't get a hold of someone, and it is frustrating, and my concerns were more minor than I'm sure of others that you've seen. So I did my homework ahead, <clears throat> asked a lot of questions because I had my doubts, and when I did got all the questions answered, I am now feeling that the right move for us right now would be priority. Yeah, it's interesting too, Val, um, one of your questions was about the Better Business Bureau and the ranking, and um, I just tried to look up how we ranked Bluefield Township <laughs> as government, but I will say, um, so. Remember those who were taking on other uh, people's numbers too. It's an too. industry that there's not much love out there for, because <laughs> yeah. uh, one, of, one of the companies ranked a one out of five, the other one was one point zero, and priority was the one out of five in this on the Better Business Bureau. Uh, GFL was 1.03 out of five, and then waste management is 1.05 out of five. So I don't know what makes up those hundreds of 
points difference there, but then I looked at Yelp and Google, and it kind of flipped everything, and priority was the higher ranked, though it was 2.8 out of five, respectively. So again, uh, and, and I did read through the comments on the Better Business Bureau. Most of them had the flavor of a commercial uh, relationship between the trash hauler and a, and a construction site or a commercial entity. Um, and that is not part of our contract. So kind of the, the point is nobody's really making hay on a really good Better Business Bureau um, uh, ranking. And I think it's got a lot to do with the squeaky wheel kind of get in the oil, right? The people that have good service and their trash provider is providing the service they expect, they're not going on the Better Business Bureau, you know, saying great job, Priority or GFL or any of those. Nobody's so. bragging about their trash. Yet. Right. But right. I, I did go looking for reviews and, you know, it was kind of all over the place. But when I hit on the Better Business Bureau, I was like, whoa. So that's when I reached out to you too. And I said, you know, this doesn't look good. But then you pointed out to me that, yeah, they all, apparently nobody loves to say the positive things about their trash <laughs> and, people. Online. You know, and, and I hope there's not a race to the bottom. I think it's more um, kind of the fact that, um, again, the people who are having complaints are the ones who are aggrieved in a situation. So, I also want to point out, I don't know that I've ever explained to the, the crew here how I picked the committee. I was purposely trying to pick people with different needs. So we are all at different stages of life, all at different stages of houses, all at different stages of everything. So I wanted, I didn't want one single vision on this because our 16,000 uh, that are affected by it, our 16,000 parcels are all very different too. So if you weren't picked, I swear there was nothing. No, no, no. Just but, to, but just to, to explain that, you know, the, I get the packet on Thursday night and yeah. as a trustee, not an employee, and not right. on that committee, so there's probably five out of four, at least four or five out of this board that had a lot more information than what I got Thursday night. And so when I read through my packet, you know, I had questions, and I didn't want to wait till tonight and say, so are we going to keep our big buckets? You know, I, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to know where we were at. I wanted to do my homework ahead because this is a big decision. Yeah. And not that GFL's done a poor job. It's just I wanted to understand, is this the right move to make? And I'm glad that you all reached out to Noah. Because of Open Meetings Act, we can't talk about all this. So this is proof that only the three of us involved on this committee talked about this. So um, I'm glad that you reached out to Noah where you can and get that. Yeah, and from our perspective, we want to have as many heads at the table. You know, <clears throat> Brian, you have a lot of experience with the past negotiations. That that's why we kind of brought you in during the negotiation process, right? And that bore fruit for us, for sure. So. Right. So I'm no longer the youngest. <laughs> so that's why I had to find someone younger. <laughs> I have a, a couple of questions, but maybe start with the bigger one, and then sure. we could talk about that, which is, um, I, I, well, the risks I see with our decision facing us tonight is the risk of change, of making a transition. Um, and there is some history of there being hiccups uh, that we can read online. What, uh, what do we know more about uh, preparations or the quality of transitions or what is being done to ensure that, that the gold standard of transitions will be, will so be is expected and will be met? A couple things, right? I would say first is a can-do attitude like was displayed in Flint. And, um, and in fact, they contracted with another company to bring in extra hands to make sure there was an accept acceptable product out there. So one is a can-do attitude. Um, the second would be preparedness, right? They have a relationship with a national truck supplier that they have already secured the trucks. In addition, they're actually going to put two extra in our community to um, facilitate the transition process. Um, and then they'll kind of make a decision with our staff on when they could pull those back. Um, additionally, it's our job and DPW to make sure that we use the full power of the townships contracts, documents, and agreements to make sure that that transition is smooth for our <coughs> residents, right? We have um, many tools at our disposal for that, but um, uh, so we'll make sure that as a staff that that transition takes place very smoothly. We have a lot of the data and the, um, and actually priorities kind of been in the township doing some investigating of their routes and kind of feeling out how long it's going to take them, that type of stuff, that due diligence. Um, so all that and their kind of plan 
running forward lets me know they're in the game to basically they want to make a good play at this right we want to see them succeed at, for our residents and for overall satisfaction so really it comes down to us holding them accountable to some extent <laughs> if there are issues they've shown that in the past with the Dearborn Hearts thing they've had to come in and clean up a mess there um, they have shown an ability to kind of be nimble in that and work through those challenges I honestly I don't usually put on the rose-colored glasses, but I'm. This is going to be pretty smooth. Not gonna oh, do it. even <laughs> like so. Okay, I am so, going to be realistic and tell you there's going to be. I would be, expect yeah, there I would mean, be growing. There's going to be growing pains, and yeah. so. I mean, they've gone through a transition several times and had some growing pains, yeah. and you, you can learn from that. I well, mean, I, think, I think I right. think the Dearborn Heights case, too, wasn't a true transition. It was a case where uh, a contractor got removed from doing that work, mm -hmm. and GFL came in. So I don't know that's priority priority a little priority different, came in. right? So, yeah. um, and well, satisfaction was there, and I think the extenuating circumstances are, in that case, were... A, that contractor being in there, then the other, the high rental in Dearborn Heights resulted in a lot, and the lawn care companies bringing the debris there to get rid of it, right? There was a lot of that going on that kind of pumped up the numbers. Then the so, storms Yeah, I just situation. want to make sure I heard you right. So the, the Dearborn Heights situation was not a transition, but a, you know, a, a well, vendor I, that was let go and a short turnaround time brought they correct brought which could be termed a transition you know it's but it was a different circumstance than what we're working with right so what if uh you know our rose colored glasses turn out not you know turn out to be what they are maybe they are rose colored glasses then we'll what, look what at the do contract we... documents and enforce provisions within the contract what provisions are there that there's allow us... um, non-performance provisions there's our rfp is included as part of the contract by reference and it states they're going to pick up the solid waste so they would be in breach of contract at that point dirk you can kind of there were at least 20 provisions within the contract that gave us an out. I've drafted a number of these contracts and you've got to blanket it with protection for the township and we did in this case. There's, um, just off the top of my head, there's liquidated damages if you want to exercise that. There's um, the ability for the township to unilaterally terminate the contract if there's a continued pattern of nonconformance, uh, fraud or criminal activities. Uh, there's default provisions and they're all, they're all, um, Exclusive remedies, you, not exclusive, I'm sorry. There are cumulative remedies. You can exercise one or all of them. So there's a number of different levels that we would have to, to protect the township in case. And to be clear, that would be an absolutely, you know, right. we have failed as a staff, in my mind, if we have to go to the legal remedy. But, but, you still, you, but, but we still have to build those into the contract to make right. sure oh, yeah. the worst case scenario happens. Not be doing our due diligence. We also have a transition built into our current contract. and. What you pointed out is GFL is a good company. Just because um, they're not getting chosen, it doesn't mean that they're a horrible company. And it would be really small-sighted to think that way. Um, and that means you probably haven't been in bidding before. If you, if you, and I get it from an outsider's perspective. If you haven't really done bids and contracts, especially these, it could be confusing. So. The thing is, in our contract right now, and GFL is a good company, they're not going to not turn over what they have to in the contract, which is if they do not get this, they have to give over the routes. They have to do this. And this is GFL. They know full well that their reputation would be on the line if they ever did that to someone, because we did help build them. Because let's make sure you know that they were the new guy to the township. Rizzo was the new guy to the township and we helped build them. They, we were, what, the first ones in Oakland County to go with them? Or I believe, or one of the yeah. first. And that, that's important, you know, it is a very incestual um, type of uh, uh, business to be in, right? right. We're in eight years, you know, GFL will other, be there, yeah. and we'll be asking them and waste management to come to the table at that point, right? And there so. are people from Priority and Waste Management and GFL that have worked at multiple of them. So again, it would be, it would be short-sighted to think that GFL would hurt themselves in that way, because there are partnerships that go around on, I know that we were told by Priority that they actually have a, a connection sometimes where they work with others when they need help together. So they do support each other, but then also you do see there are people from Priority from other places, there's people from from GFL, from others. Um, you're right, it's a, it's a there's got to be a better word than it. It's got to be a it better word. A picture, but yes, right? there are people there that were from it paints that a picture. area. Yes. Well, my my next question, real quick, is um, you know, going 
going with the lowest qualified bidder is usually a no-brainer. I mean, priority is the right. lowest qualified bidder. But sort of flipping this on, on its head, um, uh, I mean, trying to figure out why would we go with a higher bidder in this instance. And the only thing I've heard so far is, you know, they've been here a while and they have a track record. Um, but I'm also hearing that, that there have been issues. Um, I too see them sitting here in administration when they come in, some of them, well, not all of them, but uh, 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 having problems um, um, and also having resolution delays, which are the bigger concern um, that I have and I've heard many times. But uh, I, I'm really trying to see if, you know, why would we go against the lowest bidder in this instance? Well, they, I don't believe there. that the Titan? Titan would be capable. No, I mean, I well, think well, no, I'm saying, saying the lower bidder is, is, is priority. That yeah. was, is normally a, a no-brainer. Let's the go with priority. He means the lowest one lowest qualified, qualified, qualified to do it. So uh, why would we go with a higher one? I mean, what? Because in this case, I mean, um, I'm, better I'm, customer service so, no, is I'm, available. Let me, let me be more clear. He's not talking about We're Titan. right in your yeah, right now sitting here Even going, between well, GFL, GFL or priority. But priority is the lower bidder. So why would we ignore that factor to go with? I'm not saying you if were recommending we had, it, If we had just being concerns devil, devil about advocate. ability to provide yeah. the service, we would not have recommended priority waste. If we had um, a belief that there was something to the Dearborn Heights case and they shirked responsibilities in some way, that we were aware of that case in Dearborn Heights, it's been in the news for two, three years at this point. Well, we were aware before we even went out to bid. Still, the focus is on priority here. I'm, I'm actually trying to figure out why would we pick GFL? I mean, if we, they would have said the GFL services. has been here before. Yeah, it would be. But besides that, what? Down to services, right? If they came, like, if they came with a new inventive program to handle household hazardous waste, it may be a reason to consider well, that. They didn't. So they would have to show value what for they that. If came forward, why they would, would I, have to show us value? Why would for I pick that? the higher based bidder? Based on what's in front of huh? you, why would? Well, you? Based on what they've come forward with, why would I pick the higher bidder? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make up a reason why you would. It's not based in reality, so I don't know why you would. It's a list of pros there and cons that we could go through, and I'm just trying to make sure that we've at we've least considered all the pros to decide to pay more for the service. But what I've heard so far is it's it's not more service. Ostensibly less. less. Service. Right. Uh, it's going to cost more. So what we're left with is, well, you know, they in the past they've been doing a good job. That's not no reason. But, but so far that's the only one I'm seeing that would say, oh, maybe I should go against the lower bidder and ask everybody to pay $4 million more dollars. I don't just, I'm not I think sure that's, that's enough reason assessment. for me. Right. right, I think that's a fair assessment of the case. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for the vetting process, by the way. No, you and your staff did a great job. You gave us a lot of really good information to make, some deci to make a decision with. Um, I think I'm the only one up here who's been through the process of waste management, Rizzo, and GFL. In fact, <laughs> I am. And so I've been through every transition and uh, from waste management to Rizzo to GFL. And every one of these companies had strengths and weaknesses. Um, they all provided a good service. There were complaints with all three of them, a minimal complaints, because I think all three of them actually provided good services. And I do believe GFL, um, which I'll get to in a moment, has some positive things. Priorities. Um, proposal is strong and based on their um, what they've produced and provided in other communities I think they have the potential to provide good services in Bloomfield Township. I am not convinced nor am I um, ready to make a decision to vote for them based on their experience in other communities. I'm very concerned although they have stated that they're going to provide exemplary service. They've stated that they have a really good customer service line, which I have no, you know, until I see it happen, I don't know if it's actually going to be um, accurate. Um, I don't know. And uh, I do believe that Bloomfield Township, as I've stated for years, the residents deserve exemplary services. I believe that uh, GFL is actually providing some good services. They're providing what they're expected to provide, which is just to pick up the goddamn trash. They do it. They do a great job as far as what they're supposed to do. Now, all the other whistle, whistles and bells, 
I'm not diminishing them, but that's not their basic mission. It's to pick up the trash, and they do a good job. Now, do they miss? Um, do they miss some people every now and then? Of course they do. Nobody is perfect. I just went down through Waste Management in Rizzo, and they've always, they've had problems over the years. In GFL, of course, when you have that many households, you're gonna have some problems. However, they have demonstrated that even with the transition they went through, they have demonstrated they're a good provider, they're a good vendor, the community has a lot of confidence in them as far as picking up the trash. Um, I've heard over the years um, from the residents, um, they're very happy with them. It's true, um, getting through to customer service is not their strong point. I agree with that 100%. And I wouldn't be happy with it either. And I think that's something that if GFL was still uh, involved that some or are involved that it's something that really needs to be worked on even stronger from you know their uh, corporation um, as far as you know the the added value you talked about Noah and the technology yeah we're going in that direction I understand that but again we're just picking up trash and as long as the trash is being picked up and it is I don't see a reason to make a change. Um, now, if they weren't picking up the trash, if there were a significant number of complaints over their service, I would agree that it's time to make a change. But I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that through the entire period of this contract, that they don't provide the service, that they breached their contract. If there was a significant problem with them, we would have breached their contract. We would have done something about it. There would have been liquidated damages. We would have made sure that we got rid of them and we brought in uh, a different vendor, but we haven't done that. So, you know, with that said, I have a great deal of respect for you, Noah, and your staff, but this is one time that I just uh, am not going to be on, on board with your recommendation. Anyone else have anything? Michael? Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions first. Um, I thought I heard that there were going to be two hazardous household waste days, and now is it only going to be one? Or it's one of each. It's one so of our each. May and our October, just like we have now, right. we would have lost one of those. Yeah. Okay, so GFL was not willing to do which one? We had to pick, right? Uh, I, I'm not aware. That, I'm that aware during the, the extension negotiations. One. Yeah, they took the events out of the extension negotiations in the end. So they wouldn't even provide them? Correct. Okay. Which is why we went to bid. Which, now, in the bid, did they put it in? I believe they're in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. They were in and out of the negotiations. The final. Yeah. Right. The okay, final. So in, the, in the final bid that we're deciding on, they put two days in. Yes. Okay. So there's no. It difference. was during the negotiation that okay. they took those out. Okay. Yes. But, but so there's, there's no difference now between. Priority and GFL about as far as the events are concerned. Events. Correct. They're right. back in now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, my other question is about the cameras. Um, I actually heard from a lot of people um, who are concerned about, and, and now you use the word AI tonight. That also got me concerned. Um, people are concerned that that the contents of their trash are being recorded or monitored, and with AI and the use of data AI mining is not technology, in yet, right? So the they are not classified. There's a, the pictures really look at the bag, anything that's visible to the naked eye from mm -hmm. the street anyway. Right. So they would look at the trash can. They don't look at the material like they don't open the oh, material the and then right. videotape each piece of material. Okay. And the AI that we're talking about is a something that's going to be in place in the future. It's much like in a factory where, let's say, a metal detector is in place over food product to make sure that errant metal doesn't get into the equation, right? right? It uses air to just basically push that out, right? So what they're doing is classifying the waste. They're not like 
taking the text off your recycling waste. What I would say if someone, if they're gonna recycle and it's sensitive material, they would do that through a shredding entity anyway, because I wouldn't say that there's any, I mean, there's literally people at the MRF that are picking through this stuff too. So, you know, that I would definitely, any sensitive material I protect anyway. So, right. But, but no, I, it's, I, I, think some, I think some people are, are concerned, and again, I'm just sharing what I've heard uh, over the last few days is that if somebody puts out a pizza box, they're going to get labeled as a pizza eater, and then they're going to start getting ads for pizza. <laughs> um, no, but I, I don't know that I, they've I, monetized I, I, it that far. I um, but uh, I mean, Todd can I want to make sure that the talk about the extent of that. But I think I, people got more to worry about right here. Yeah. Oh, no question. <laughs> no well, question. But, you know, but, my, my response was that, that you're going to get mined for, in terms of your data at the point of purchase, not at the point of. Yeah, I would say your but, credit card and your But the pizza box thing did come up, and I will say there is something to this because my recycling did not got t did not get taken because somebody put a pizza box on it. So when they went to open it, GFL didn't take it. Right, that's that Which is a it I is a contaminant, like right? Yeah, All so, the grease right. comes so up the wheels. Take it. We didn't put so. it in there. People put like dog poop in your stuff. But that's stuff different now. than kind of learning people's People habits oh, that's based on their garbage. Just, so I'm, the I'm, difference is we ain't there now. yet. Right. This uh, is I'm the garbage just, I'm, industry. I'm just so the, sharing concerns. So yep. wait, but this concern would actually be better now because before they just didn't take it. And I had to figure out why I had to call. That's how I know they do make you wait a while and they don't call back. So I called Noah and Noah said, well, it's because you had something in there. I'm like, why couldn't they just take it and leave me a note? Right. So these supposedly, if they see something on the top, they're going to still take it and send you a note saying like, hey, for future reference, help us help throw you that out. To, yeah. you know. Which I would have been fine with. Right. And that's going to classify like. No, I, I mean, I see, I see the value in having the, the cameras like, um, you know, I heard another story today from somebody who has a restaurant and they have a large commercial dumpster and that somebody parked a car in front of their dumpster overnight and when the, tra the trash hauler came out to empty the dumpster, they couldn't because the car was there. And so they took a picture of it and she got an email within That's hours exactly saying, we, we couldn't get thing, your right? dumpster today because somebody parked a car in front of it, have the car moved and we'll come back, right. you know? Right. So I see the value in that in terms of the customer service aspect. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not mining data. Um, oh. And I will say every over the road truck has these cameras in place that's right. a long haul trucker right now. This is right. the way that. And GFL has cameras too. Yeah, it, it, again, they're focused on the liability factor, which is drivers. So they don't, call, they don't, do, they don't do the other cameras. Exterior facing exterior, is, exterior. is not the protocol, right? They're looking to basic, and that's right. the federal highway safety, you know, the federal, the federal regulations are pushing that yeah. for internal cab liabilities. Right. right. But in our negotiations with them, there was an expectation that they would be buying these trucks. They're upfitting them. It's just them. that yeah. we wouldn't get currently. them for yeah. what, two years or something. Yeah, there's yeah. a lag time. So it They're would be coming regardless of who Yeah, has no, I, it. I see the value in it in terms of what you're describing in terms of. Yeah. Really, it's the complaint, it's the customer education, right. it's the going on faith with a trash hauler, like let's the complaint about contaminated recycling, yeah. where we have to ask our residents, well, give me the video, stand out in the front yard and videotape them doing it. We can't, you know, we this is where we get, take it out to a third party, which is the camera, yeah. look at what's actually going on and make a determination then. And I will say we do have multiple, um, <laughs> and there are one-off, but we do have people that do get skipped week after week after week, whether it's due to construction, whether it's due to um, a bad road that they live on. There are ongoing kind of issues, but I will say they are very responsive to that. So, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, undermine the fact that GFL has been a great partner during this whole thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and then, then I, I just have a couple of comments. So, um, I also... Uh, did my homework and saw the Dearborn Heights issue, um, and I spoke with Trustee Fakie today, um, and I appreciate that she took the effort to reach out to their elected officials, and as you said, um, they would make the same decision again, right? Um, and so, so I appreciate that. So I, that that's that's um, not not so much an issue for me. Um, um, I like the idea, I think it was Treasurer Keeps who said loyalty and continuity are very important uh, cornerstones of the way that we like to do things. Um, but at the same time, we need a partner to meet us at least halfway. 
And um, as the supervisor said, we reached out to GFL uh, to try to negotiate an extension without going to bid, and they just wouldn't meet us. And they took out the, the days and the costs, uh, as I understand it. Well, they the did. Don did show. That's why I will never say anything bad about Don, because Don is a superstar, but he's retiring. <laughs> so right. um, knowing that that's right. my one like yeah. Well, that's I mean gone. that's a huge I mean that's a huge factor because yeah. customer service comes down to people and connections right. and you know having at a large corporation, multinational corporation. Right. Um, having and, and knowing the right people who are monitoring your account is very, very important. Um, I also have never had a problem with GFL, and in fact, in the few years now that I've been working at home, um, as a result of, well, you know why. But um, I hear the trucks coming three, four, five times on my pickup day, um, and so uh, I'm, I'm impressed by that I'm wondering what they're doing going five <laughs> times but um, so that I've always been impressed with their level of customer service or their production service um, the customer service again I've heard that we've had a lot of vendor complaints um, and that is an issue and the fact that they won't give us a dedicated line I think is an issue um, and and one worth thinking about um, one drawback that I have is, as the clerk said, um, that you know he was saying, why should we go with the higher bid? Um, well, one of my concerns is that priority is only five years old, and most of their municipal contracts are less than three years old. Um, so that's not a long history of uh, production that we can that we can look to, and you know, um, you know, my concern in trying to fix something that isn't broken is that if you break it then you own it. Um, and so that's, that's a concern for me. Um, but, you know, if we had, could have just gotten there, you know, halfway in the negotiation, we wouldn't, it, but, but you're right. I mean, coming back again to what the clerk said that they're the low bidder. And we went through an open bid process. Everybody had a chance to submit their, their bids. And just as we did with the SAD what well, seems like four hours ago, um, <laughs> when we uh, voted to uh, award that contract to the lowest bidder, um, that's that's uh, you know in the in the public trust that's what you do. So uh, those are my thoughts. They were kind of haphazard, I guess, but. Um, um, I will, Todd is here in the audience, uh, Todd Stamper, the CEO, I don't know if you guys want to hear from him, but he is here, I wanted to just point that out. Um, if you have specific concerns, questions you want on the record right now, this would be a good time to... And I will say it is comforting to me, I, can, <laughs> on a, I can't throw a rock and hit his house, but it is a half a mile as the crow flies from our facility. So I think there is If he some messes up, I'm going to try and throw the I, I would, over there. I can promise I would you. say that, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> if, 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 if there are problems, you can expect people to bring their garbage to your house. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll be one of them. What? I, I, do, I, I just want to add also, um, in addition to my conversations with the elected officials, the proposal that we received from Priority Waste did include a reference letter from Dearborn Heights saying that they are happy with priority ways. So to me, it's it's really not a concern. I have a question about when you showed a slide up there. It was one I hadn't seen before this. Um, was Oakland County one of those on the right? It showed connections, too, and I don't remember there being. They're a commercial. They provide oh, commercial, commercial service, just like Warren is, okay. is that kind of way Because that threw me for a minute. I yeah, it's commercial. They provide commercial pretty much anywhere. In the Wait, I have a question. Now that I see that, how is, totally is, different animal. how is Westland nine years? I thought the company was only five years old. Their current term of the contract is nine years. Nine year it's not how oh, long they've been years. with it. Oh, right. oh I okay. say it's January of night. Term of the contract. Yep. Right. Sorry, I missed that. So the, yeah, 2019. Mm -hmm. So four years. Yeah. Are there any other questions, comments? Again, this is a time if you do have concerns too to ask them directly to somebody. 
a decision maker in the room. Well, I could toss out a few more <laughs> ideas. It, it's, it's, a, um, I don't know which way to go on this. I, I mean, I argued, I, you know, go with the lowest pri person and why, why go against that, uh, lowest qualified bidder and why go against that. But on the other hand, I mean, we could argue the other way, which is, you know, GFL is a known commodity. <coughs> I mean, we know what they provide. It's it's been, um, you know, as, as um, Trustee Barnett has said, you know, they've been here a long time. They've provided very good service. Everybody has hiccups. Um, that known commodity and the priors and the years of service you know, is, is has a value. It's, it it's, it is important. Um, so we're entering a you know if we go with this, we'd enter into a period of risk. And you know, what are the potential benefits of that? Um, you know, does it make that risk worthwhile to engage in? Um, and you know, I just, I just, my head hasn't gotten around that completely yet as to as to what those are. And I do hear a lot of people talk about complaints, and you know, I see complaints, but I don't have any data or volume on it. Um, you guys have some numbers on the number of complaints that come in? Ah, uh, there was a billing issue a couple years ago. I think when we tracked the volume of calls <laughs> coming in, but no, I I, ju I can get a sense of it because I do get them. Just to clarify, you're not saying it was a couple years ago that we got a pl complaint. No, a couple okay, years I, ago we got, was like, a got a very accelerated, a very okay. large amount of complaints because there was an issue oh, with the billing system. Yeah. Um, so I think we started tracking at that point. What I can say is that uh, it's cyclical. Um, a, it, they get good for a while, then it gets bad. And I have the three ladies sitting out in front of me in, in the admin area, so I hear them, then I get the overflow when they can't be handled. And so that's why I know when the people elevate to my level, like the lady who hasn't had her garbage picked up repetitively over like a five, six month period right. um, with the billing issues, the non-response, I'm keenly aware of those because they rise to my level at that point. So the, and I will say it's a major issue at times in my office. It gets to my level, it's even high. Like realize sure. people are kind enough to start with, let's start with Katie. If it doesn't work, let's go to Noah. If it's gotten to mine, <coughs> If somebody's still not getting resolution, that's well, gone on for a while before. I would say, we kind of talked about yeah. this, should we just <laughs> search Peggy's emails to me saying it's a GFL problem? Um, in the week, tens. In a month, a bad month, hundreds, right, of complaints or issues. The billing issue sticks out as a red thumb in my uh, my mind because it was very high volumes. What was the so billing two, issue? They was there Wasn't was uh, some information the, put out about. The discount. Oh, the annual payment the discount. discount was, right. Was it wasn't included on some documents that went out that created. We got mad thinking we got rid of thousands the, of calls the to our discount. DPW. Thousands? Yeah. Oh. I mean, you're talking 16,000 16, accounts. 16,000 people, so. and they thought the annual discount got taken away. Who there are thousands of people who prepay. Uh, well, I'd have to. We have thousands of calls because, again, volume-wise, they. Someone well, can call more than once, right? And so it just thousands. doesn't. Or know. there's. People. But yeah, a lot of people take advantage of the discount and pay early because they know they're going to pay this or it's going to go on their taxes. So why not get a discount? Well, my recollection, by the way, was this was the second year in a row for that same issue. Yeah. Right? No? I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was the second right? That's year. a head shaking yes? Yeah. So which is part of the issue. From Katie, so. <laughs> but I don't. But the lack of data, though, is a little bit of a concern. Yeah, I mean, we can get the lot, call logs. What were we got the call logs as part of the interview process, and it showed what percentage of kind of resolution. I was just listening in from a vehicle, but, oh, yeah. but, but yeah, I, I actually did, thousands, I did want to mention that though. So one part of the meeting that we had with GFL we had already met with Priority Waste, so we already knew that potentially we're gonna get better customer service from them. So we brought that up as an issue with GFL, and the response from GFL was, well, we've um, hired additional people in our call center and look at our percentage of calls that are answered with this um, you know, reasonable amount of time and look at how many of the calls were resolved during that initial phone call. And the percentages that we were looking at were you know, 50 to 60%. And this is after they've added additional staff to address concerns and you still have people waiting on the line for in excess of five to 10 minutes. And even when they're getting somebody on the line, the problem is not not resolved. So to me, you know, if the concerns of customer service were actually being addressed, then maybe in my mind it would be more of a competition. So I, I hear what, you know, um, Trustee Barnett is saying, I, I hear what Clark Brooke is saying as far as 
it's waste hauling, just pick it up, what we have is good enough. But from where I sit in Bloomfield Township, we don't just go with good enough, we want the best. And if we can have the best customer service, we should have that. And it shouldn't be 50% of calls get resolved when the customer has an issue. It should be 100% are resolved in a reasonable amount of time. Just for clarification though, when I said good enough, I was not referring to the call center, I was referring to the trash pickup where they think they do an excellent job. I didn't say good enough, just accept it. I was referring to the calling center that I said it's not good enough. So it's, I just want to get that on the record. Yeah, no doubt we all want the best service of the best And also, um, just to get back to one more thing, um, Martin, getting it's a risk, right? Mm -hmm. It's a risk to make a change and hopefully if we make a change, it will go well, but I'm not willing to take that risk when I believe that the service, as far as trash pickup, is outstanding. Well, I, I think, you know, we've all kind of gone around, and, and one of my biggest issues when I first read it was, you know, why change from GFL? They've done a really good job. And can this company handle the volume of residents we have? And that's why I did my homework and found, and, and in addition, you know, my concern was, you know, like, are they going to provide the large volume 95 gallon um, carts? Yes, they are. They're going to sell them at a discount. That's a help. The fact that they've already bought the trucks, because we went through growing pains when we went with Rizzo, because we went with Rizzo and then they had legal issues and then GFL took over. And there were issues where GFL said, um, you know, you can have these bigger carts because we can, you know, we can pick those up. And I said, no, you know, we can't because they, what happened was they tore apart my garbage cans and I called and complained as a regular resident and they said, well, replace it. Somebody showed up on my doorstep. I was very impressed with that service. Um, never called the township. And they brought me the big green truck, the big, 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 big green thing. And I said, no, I can't use it because that's too big. It's too heavy. We're not allowed more than 33 gallons. And the person was super nice, but he said, who have you been talking to? And I said, well, the trash service for the last 10 or 15 years that I've lived here. You can't go over 60 pounds and 33 gallons, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, this isn't going to work. And what happened was, this was one of the growing pains was, so he convinced me that, no, that, that's crazy. You can use this thing. So the next week we filled it, not full, but we half filled it, whatever it was. I put it out. I see the Rizzo truck, which GFL had taken over. There was no lift, because he said, we have lifts. And I'm like, there was no lift. And I see the guy like tip it over and reach inside, and he's pulling my garbage out. So I called GFL back and said, OK, there's no lift on these trucks. Why are you giving me this gigantic trash container that we can't handle? And the short answer is, they were in a transition. They didn't have all the lift trucks, and sometimes they couldn't handle the bigger can, but they would send the old trucks. And over time, what I found was a few months later, the green truck shows, and it's got a lift. And one day when a truck showed without a lift, I see the guy out there, and he's like pushing on my container, and he gets on the radio and says, send the lift truck, because my, that week my trash was heavier than 60 pounds. Um, it, was, it was a you know kind of a transitional time. We took a risk on Rizzo, and I think that it's worth seeing and hearing what priority is offering us. It's a much better value. The customer service, I'm going to go on faith and say that it will be better. Um, and I was concerned about the trucks. They've already purchased the lift trucks. Um, they've grown with other communities of substantial size. So um, I was very concerned initially would they be able to handle us and not have a lot of issues. But my confidence has grown. And, um, and that's why I, I feel like I will still support them. Dean, I just want to uh, clarify, have no clarify something. Um, a resident, I'm not sure where I saw it or heard it, but a resident was concerned um, what's going to happen with people that paid um, for, for the year service. Um, and just clarify when that year starts and begins and why it's important that we do this tonight in terms of the cycle of, of the year. So it's important for that discount uh, to kind of get in and for tax purposes, but it's also important to make sure we're prepared for this contractor to transition over. Um, it takes, there is a long period of that transition for all the billing and everything. Um, so. For as soon as possible for that, right? So what? Uh, and and when when does when, for people who have paid a year for a year? When does that year expire? I think it's June. Isn't June. It? I just want to 
Okay. Because there the, you the, go. Concer- the concern I'll say, catch was what pitching. No, no, so. <laughs> the concern was you know, what happens to those that still have time left and this, the contract. Right, there's not a lag at all through the end of June. Correct. Right? Yeah. So whoever is paid a year is going to get their full year. Right. Regardless of what we do. Correct. Right. And I know it's June because my husband's older than I am, so we qualified not only for the for the 11 month pay in advance, but the senior discount. You said that twice tonight. Yeah. Well, he, it's, it's the truth. I speak. The Our truth. discounts are very important to us. I think that's the overarching. Factor, but it, it's it be always been June discount. to June, right? That's and I'm I'm prepaid for the year. I I'm not worried. Typical anniversary date is the July first date, so that's what and breeds that back. Noah, in, in our discussions, and I heard you say it this evening, and I just want to be very clear that as part of this contract, it's our expectation and what we've contracted for that there are absolutely no additional surcharges for anything. Correct. And this is this this industry in particular, I've I found to be extremely, I'll call it creative, um, in terms of the surcharges that are administered. And there can be administrative, there can be tipping, there can be gas surcharges, recycling. We were approached in the last contract for a recycling uh, adder when the bottom fell out of the recycling market during the recession. And but but again, I just want to say I think it's really important to this contract that, that you've also focused on it is that there will be no surcharges charges included or approved correct okay. and that was uh, because well again we tried to get an extension and in that extension beforehand there were fuel charges and some other things we discussed in there. those yeah and, yeah. and we pushed back but on at those. this point we're yeah. both contracts are the same where there are no surcharges correct okay yep. anyone else have any questions Is anybody ready to make a motion so sorry, but public comment has already happened. This is a board discussion right now to try and, and again, uh, I know we also had a lot of public comment that I'm not, they did not show up today, but I got a lot that are not happy with us not going with the lowest bidder. And again, just to point that out, the lowest bidder, Titan, just wasn't ready. There are a lot of questions you have already answered. So, great. So if, if there's any other, if not, I'd look Can for I ask one more question? Yeah. <laughs> Earlier, you uh, referenced a word that's probably an acronym, and, and um, we've talked about it before. Uh, it's not Smurf, but MRF. Um, and I want to know more about um, their so with this MRF and what that does. And for me, I'm you know I put my you know loyally put out my recyclables out there, which I clean diligently because I want them to be worth a lot of money so they can sell them and actually be recycled. Right. That's really important to me. Um, how will that, I mean, and, and GFL has a, their, their own MRF, you know, to, to process this. MRF stands, must stand for something associated with recycling. Yeah. What I, right, it's a material resource, I don't know what the E is. Uh, <laughs> So basically, it's a single stream recycling facility that you could just dump, for all intents and purposes, a truckload of trash at the beginning of the facility, and then it's categorized out or you know sorted out into the saleable items. And if you start with a dirtier product in the beginning, you have less saleable product when you get to the end of this process. All of the recycling in this area is taken and processed through a MRF. Um, so it, that's how you achieve the value out of it. So uh, and GFL does has a new one. It's been under construction for a couple of years now. So um, and Todd, you guys take it to what facility? We take your materials to Sakra. Sakra facility where they would categorize it down there. So so Sakra that were not in that group, they utilize them to to do their MRF activities down there. So. Um, what, uh, so it's, a, it's the new wave of recycling that treats it as a single stream. So we don't, as the resident, have to sort it like we used to have to do when recycling first came out, where you had to put all your cans to one side, make sure there's no labels, all this stuff. They, it kind of is getting over the hump of getting people to participate to the maximum extent in their recycling. So is there something in the contract that helps to ensure that, that the material they're picking up here actually gets to the facility? Yeah. So yeah, and we had a problem with that facility? with the prior waste hauler where uh, waste was commingled with another community, um, but we do have provisions within the contract to prevent that, and we worked through that with that with uh, GFL as well when that occurred. So okay, so that that would be a concern of mine. I mean, GFL has their own Smurf, so I know it goes there because they have their own Smurf. Murph. 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 Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Murph. They have their own Murph. Right. Not Smurf. Murph. They have their own Murph. Um, Priority doesn't have their own Murph, so they must have to pay to use that facility. Or I think they, it comes um, out of their revenue from the recycling, I assume, through the, I don't know what the business arrangement is between Sacra and, or Sacra and them. Sacra wants the material. The material they want, they want, because there is a value to it, right? But I don't know what the inner working of their arrangement Sacra is. Sacra stands for? South Oakland County Resource Recovery Authority. Sacra. It's the Sacra, it's Water the, Sacra. It, down at eight mile. Like Sacra. Sacra. Yes. Ah, yeah. right. Okay. Um, well, I just didn't and my, I just and my mind. state, it just federal laws require that that material goes there, whether you trust that or not. But you can bring that to bear with federal regulations on it. And the trash hauling business is very regulated. Just like compost can't go into a regular landfill, recycling is even more regulated. Right. right yeah. So. Right. Well, it just seems to be an advantage to vertically integrate that for for GFL versus having to go somewhere else. Um, Depending on the business relationship, yeah, sure. it might be. You know, but if you're sit, if you have a bunch of material that's classified and you got no market for it, maybe that's the worst end yeah. to be in. <laughs> if you're sitting on a bunch of material, you know. I do have another question now. I uh, put out a lot of yard waste. It seems to be, you know, more and more of that building all the time with wind and so forth. Um, I know there's rules associated with regard to bundling and bagging and all that kind of stuff. I have, by the way, with a yard waste or any other sorts of things, I've never had a problem with GFL. That's my personal experience. But that's not what I'm voting on, by the way, um, whenever I make up my mind. Um, what Can we talk a little bit about that? What the, the Both contracts are, are similar with regard the to same. the yard waste yep. pickup? Same. So the bundling requirements, all that are, will remain the same. Remains the yep. same. Yep. And quantities and all that, they're prepared to take. We understand, like uh, the first slide, I think, said we're an abnormally large producer of compost waste. Also the same duration? I mean, you yes. go yep. kind of late in the fall and where We in the pushed spring. it to the statutory limit. So there is a limit in December where you can't put any more, or November when you can't put any more in, we're at that limit. Because like in the winter, they don't have the ability to compost it and all this stuff. So okay. We're up against the statutory Can, I, can I add to that point, though? That, that was a, a concern that we talked about with both GFL um, and, and Priority. Um, because, you know, we've been talking about missed items and missed pickups and that is problems. One of the problems could be, which we don't have, which is important to, to note, is um, GFL refusing to pick up items. Um, which, you know, it's, it's one thing to drag it out oh, there. sorry. What did you say? GFL, we have not had a problem with GFL um, refusing to pick up items. Even if it's oversized. For Even instance. if it's oversized. Yeah, like, I cheat a little bit on my people yard do waste, cheat. I must admit. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that, that is something to be commended and something we spoke about with, with priority because, the expect, because, you know, there's one thing of dragging it out, then you get it tagged, and then insult to injury is having to drag it back in. So no one wants to do that. Um, I'm not suggesting that um, you know construction debris um, is acceptable because it isn't. And if it's excessive, they're not going to take it. But you know, GFL has been extremely good about not refusing items, and we've had the same commitment. I mean, there's the contract, and then there's how they work, and we've had the same commitment from priority, which I think is important to state. That's that's a big item or could be a big item. Right. And that leads yeah. into our hesitancy to go to a cart only program, which is kind of the way the industry's going. We don't believe that provides the service level that our residents are seeking at this well, point. Can you describe what that is? What's a cart only program? It's only what can fit in the cart. You, can, you have a large bulk item, you got to call them for a special pickup, either pay separate for that. It's it's really to streamline the industry, right? Where waste management, if they know they're picking up the same, uh, that's their paradigm, that's why I use them as that example. If they know they're picking up the same container and it's uniform in every single house, they can do it faster. They don't have their people lifting the uh, containers so they can have older drivers and you know people that may not have the ability to lift cans work and so it extends their life on the job which is many of the benefits they've explained at priority for why they have these tippers on the trucks is it 
makes their employee experience better, helps with worker retention, and you know, it's so that's why they're going that way for uniformity, and, and then there's some cost savings to that for the business and theoretically for the township. We just don't feel like it, it wouldn't fly where I live because they take everything to, and GFL took over for waste management where I am in Farmington Hills. Um, there's just certain types of communities, either you've got to educate them and educate them on what it actually means when you get those carts, and only those carts. Uh, so we just, to make that leap in this contract, we kind of want to see where everybody's at. Uh, we want to see how much of a market we have for the bigger carts here, and that'll drive kind of our decision making on if people are ready for that type of thing. And we're talking eight years down the road, so, so maybe. I have one more question. So, you know, with the recent storms, we all, like the, the um, yard refuse pickup kind of came right at the right time it because did. we had those storms. Yep. And, and GFL so, stepped to the plate with that. And I can't say. tell you how many people ask me, when does that start? Um, but one of the things I noticed the other day, and I, I looked on my newsletter and I couldn't seem to find an answer, was my neighbor across the street had a GFL chipper truck pull up and the employees got out and chipped like all so the bigger you pieces can, of wood. Is that a pay extra service? They had a contract that's sort I, of separate. Well, I figured because yep. the homeowner didn't come out and shove the stuff in the truck. I thought this right. <laughs> had a chipper. I've never seen that yep. where they brought out a chipper truck and, and he just had, you know, his stuff at the road and they took care of it. And I was like, well, I know that was pay yep. extra or not. I didn't know that was Yeah, available. and you know, I'd always suggest that somebody gets three quotes on something like that. But okay. yeah, they may be the low bidder. They're already in the neighborhood, you know, so ostensibly they may have some economy of scale. Yeah, I just, I was not aware of that. Um, but one other thing when you're saying about employees and retaining employees was when I was searching for reviews, um, I dug kind of deep to try and you know, help make my decision. And one of the things that I came across was that Priority had the happiest employees, more retention, because they felt it was a good place to work. And I, I appreciated that, because that's certainly what we want for our employees in Bloomfield Township, because then they're more likely to stick around, know the job, be a better resource and provide a better service for everybody. Maybe lend that extra hand or go that extra mile, certainly. Yeah, yeah it was an interesting review that I stumbled on. Where'd you find that? Where? Online somewhere? <laughs> the abyss. <laughs> so I, I went to Indeed and I found that the pay was the same. They both, you know, the comments you know, just was a wash. Because that is important. Um, you know, the, the GFL, we, we refer to GFL, but it doesn't pick up anything. The, the people pick it up. It's a hard work. It's a hard job. Um, I really appreciate all the work they've always done. So it's like any other service. It's ultimately provided by the people who, who they have to go out and do this. and. You know, and it's great. So it's definitely the type of service that you don't want somebody who's having a really, really bad day, right? <laughs> uh, you want to make sure you want to have a company in here that's making sure that they're supporting their people and their drivers, that they're their outward-facing people, and we want to make sure they're giving them the tools to be successful and and even extend their career. Because really, a lot of the issues why they skipped in Farmington Hills, where I was, was COVID and manpower issues. So. I do believe Priority has recognized that stress on their business practice, their system, that people are becoming an issue, right? The trucks aren't the issue, the material's not the issue, it's the bodies, and it's, you know, the paradigm of having a CDL and an over-the-road driver versus someone slinging trash, right? So. I have an additional question, um, and I, I just want to make sure I've got it clear in my head between because we had conversations with GFL prior to the bid process, and then we have the bid process. Correct. Okay, so as far as the bid process, the GFL bid on the same exact specifications that Priority bid on. Correct. Okay, and their bid came in a little bit higher. Correct. Uh, GFLs did, okay. In that RFP, and I, I, I must have, I, I don't remember it, but I'm gonna just ask anyway. Is there any type of SLA service level agreement about customer service and response time that they that each side that each each company would have to commit to? Was there a deadline for response yeah. for? There are. There, yeah. there, there is. is. Multiple missed trash issues. There's there's there deadlines is. for responding and corrective action. And there's escalating fines. You have to come fines? Up there. Well, liquidated fines. damages, which are basically fines. Yeah. The bottom line is yes, it's yeah. it's yeah. replete with it. Well, okay, it's so 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 all of the and is the okay. So the concern with GFL is well, they're not going to be able to meet that SLA because of past history, right? Based on they don't have the people or whatever. Or 
but I mean, they're committing to the same SLA they, that priority would be. So they committed to it eight years ago for that, and so we said, why don't we have it? They said, we could give it to you any day. We said, turn it on, and it's still not turned on. Okay, so so it's it's a it's so a it's, it's an issue of well, they're they're saying that they're going to commit to it as part of the bid, it. but they yeah. haven't done right. it. Right. Then it falls even, to staff even for accountability, we, even though we've right. been asking for it. Right, and uh, as far as maintaining that SLA, so. Uh, Trustee Murray said before that we're taking it on faith that they're going to be able to meet that customer service level. Um, did you look at the number of people in the customer service center yep. between the two companies to say, oh, wait, they've got double the number of people. So we, we know, did the we, site visit. We know. That, yep. Okay. We did the site visit. There's the LDC paradigm that I laid out to you that that is that extra layer that we believe is going to kind of make the difference. And that is the extra layer that allows for the information sharing. We were literally viewing their people out picking up the trash. Right. right? But isn't the LDC the people that are in correspondence with the driver? Right. But that's all what but, the. But, oh, but, you're but, talking from a well, cost I'm saying, center I'm perspective? Saying if we're saying that they have to respond to a call in less than two minutes, and I don't I don't know what the number is in the SLA, but if we have to commit to, a, to answering a call and solving a problem in two minutes and then solving the problem 80% of the time or some, whatever the number is, um, what is the confidence that Priority is going to be able to do that? Do we know the number of people that they have? I can't, uh, how many people, uh, how many drivers per LDC? 11, so what I can say is that extra level there has assured to me that that's gonna give me the real-time data to be able to address customer service issues, right? I get a call, I don't have to call and wait for the black box to produce it, right? I will be talking to the person who's in the ear of the driver. I've got this person telling me you skipped their house, right? So then so, they're so, real so time the, looking at it. Time so, I'm, so I'm clear, so if I call up and say they missed my house, I'm talking to the person who's there with the person along the, the LDC. Two people answer the phone yeah. to categorize calls and get you to that LDC, but then you go to that LDC. So there's two people interfacing the call, getting you, okay, commercial, residential, categorizing where you're at, then get you to that LDC. Yeah. So it, in, in it's that key is that other layer there that uh, provides for that awareness for what's going on in the field and takes away the lag time, that type of thing. Right, so how many drivers do our routes? How many did you plan on? Nine trucks. How many drivers in Bloomfield? I forget, there was. I'm gonna put 10 in the start. Mm -hmm. So 10 drivers, one LDC, two people answering the phone. So there'll be an LDC dedicated to your options. When you call in, uh, you Can you repeat when, when he's done, will you repeat it? Right the LDC, you'll be talking to the person that's watching the truck on your street. Yeah, so they will answer the calls via two ans people that will answer, categorize where your call is supposed to go, send you onto the LDC, and you're at real-time information at that point, right? And that's when they're looking yeah. at, okay, was it out there? Hey, you know, the time is 7, we're going to come back and get it, you know, gently educate. We've been assured that's going to be the process multiple times, you know, so you're not going to get left out to dry, um, and they're just going to skip you because you're on your second strike or anything like that. So I think that, I mean, the, the, the way they've developed how their management of their drivers is differing is the proof in the pudding that you know there is that second layer from yeah. a management perspective the lag time that i have between when i can get the question answered and when the, i can give it to the resident breeds some suspicion you know it's been three days since i called you why can't they tell me that you know they weren't dumping that in the landfill right and so the speed that lends to the credibility of it, the on the ground data and real time, you know, avenue of this lends to that credibility and lends to better customer service. So, it also lends when you went to the visit, the site visit, you mentioned that there were a lot of younger people that work there, which is which, or you said it attracted a younger group. Which, when you talk about not just retention of who you have. But you got to fill as retirements happen, which we're going through right now. As people retire, we're lucky that they want to come work at Bloomfield Township. We have other municipalities around us that it took us maybe three months to fill a position. They're at two years to fill a position. 
So you had said something about they're trying to attract, not just retain. Or maybe that's attract. just happening uh, because of their business model, right? They are a, okay, a tech, tech company in the waste tech. industry. So that's okay. appealing to some generations, maybe okay. not mine as much, uh, or, right. or I consider myself a Gen X, not a millennial. So there's differences there, right? Um, but I think the wages, the atmosphere, the support from management, all that adds into a what you see displayed there right yeah and and all their i'm trying to think back on the ldc table they were all younger people younger than me uh in there i think that's just lent to that i mean literally it was a whole wall of tv screens i don't know that i'd have been able to handle the information overload that these kids or this other generation is able to handle nowadays um so it would have kind of boggled my mind to have 50 different computer screens up in front of you at any given time, but you know, they're well suited for that task. So, yeah, that might be how why it attracts <laughs> younger people because they were, you know, born into this technology. We have to learn it. Yeah, and even me. <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay, so here's my next one. We uh, response time. I mean, that's we, we're talking about that. That's a big deal. We know that mistakes will happen. But the, the responding to those issues um, and the, the promptness of that really paramount. I'm hearing a lot of statements saying that we, the L, based on the LDCs or the technology or the We've seen G, GFL, and it was discussed earlier, provided us some data on their response times, which was noted didn't look very stellar. Um, uh, you know, but what do we have any sort of data that relates to priority, you know, and their response times from yeah. other communities? And how does that compare? Yeah, we received uh, a call log for Katie. Gross Seal, was it? Katie, just come up, please. It's hard for him to keep <laughs> like, kind of replying to what you guys like. are saying, because then Noah has to just repeat it, and we're on Give the general our 17. <laughs> they came, when we met with priority, they brought case study, I think it was gross oh, He's away from the microphone. Right. <laughs> Both of you need to be at the microphones. Not right. off the record. No, <laughs> step up. I'm trying to jack her memory. Sir, yeah, <laughs> I, he's getting the, the question fully for me. What, what was the... Oh, okay. So we, um, it's been discussed, response times are paramount uh, to re resolve issues. It's been uh -huh. discussed that GFL showed some data about their response times. The data might not have been that, that stellar about the percentage uh, and timeliness. But do we have any data um, from priority and, and their response, issue resolution and response times from other communities that we could compare apples to apples. It wasn't so much like a time, I don't recall a time, like it was like any report that said it resolved in a certain amount of time, it was more so like these issues were resolved the amount of complaints that they had you know they had logs from that like how many calls they were getting but i don't know that we you know we didn't necessarily solicit that exactly so i don't know that we have an exact apples to apples to compare but would todd be able to provide that now i mean he might can you please come up you have to come up here okay. <laughs> it's about time to come on up here there are people well. <laughs> for the recording that's played later we we have this available I'll, I'll, Todd to be Stamper. fair, I'd also like to hear from GFL on this topic, sure. too. Uh, Todd Stamper, 1375, Cena Court, uh, Priority Waste. To answer the question on response times, um, MMWA, it's not in our contract. Um, we built a portal for them, and when they put, when, the, when customers call or residents call into their um, offices, it goes into our portal. We have a four-hour response time via email, and it's contracted if there is a missed pick, pickup that it has to be picked up. Uh, if it's not picked up by 5 p.m., it has to be picked up the following morning, first thing. And we would we have the same thing set up, or would set up the same thing for Bloomfield Township. You're, it's your own portal, so we'll log every call that comes in. But if any calls were to come to the city or the township itself, you'll have access to the portal, so you can see everything. So our response times, to me, it's it's one of the top things, customer service, right? So. Um, general response times are immediate with the LDCs because they're going to the driver, and if the driver's past that street already, he's saying, hey, I can loop back, and the LDC has the, the resident on the phone if they so choose to stay on the phone, or if the LDC um, didn't hear back from a driver, maybe he was out of the truck, 
it's instant that they call back and say, hey, I heard from the driver. He's going to turn back around. He'll have you picked up. And everything's on camera, so you can always look. And just to be clear, the cameras aren't to play a gotcha game that, that it wasn't there, I'm not going back. No. It's, they're going to go back because no. they get a call. No, but it's interesting, the stats that we've been running since the cameras and the whole system's been launched, it's almost 80% of the time is, is a mis, mis pickup or somebody forgot to put something out or they put it out late. But you'll still go back. Yeah, we go back. We go back and get it. We just let them know. Just say, hey, we got it on camera. Control education. Yeah, just we got it on camera. It wasn't out there, but no big deal. Don't worry about it. We'll come back and get it. So they don't have to wait till the next week? Not next week. It'd be next day. That Even day. if it was a Friday service, we'd send somebody out on Saturday to get it. We don't do weekly. We do next day. Okay. If I, if I could just offer, like, one more example. Um, it, so you're right. The trash gets picked up, GFL and priority, but one... Uh, from a staff perspective and someone that is dealing with the customer service end of it all the time, um, GFL is very good. They have a route supervisor uh, in the field. So we do have a person in the field. Um, but it's, it's, so I had one stop that was getting missed repeatedly. It happens on a Friday. Um, so when I contacted GFL, I have access to the route supervisor. He could go and get it picked up right then and there, so that was great. So technically the issue got resolved. But for me, going back and closing the loop with the customer and trying to provide an answer as to, because that's what, why does this keep happening to me? So the route supervisor, I have to tell him, okay, go check this out, pick it up, come back to me and talk to me about it, like what's going on here? His driver tells him that, oh, it's a late, a late set, they're not putting it out on time. I don't have any way of confirming that. Um, and so the solution was, it's a late set, we took care of it, and next week, a week later, we'll have our route supervisor go out there and check, snap a picture if it's not out. So I gotta wait an entire week to close the loop with that customer to provide them information and answers as to why their trash wasn't being picked up. That's just one example. So for me, the customer service side, from a staff perspective, um, having instant information is valuable to me from a staff perspective. I don't know if it's, I mean, it, 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 we've heard from Priority, and thank you, it was helpful. Um, thank you. Thank I don't you. want to dismiss you or anything, but if we want to hear from, Done. if you guys want to comment about response to times or anything like that, is that Don, okay? Don, do you want to come on up? I mean, it, or you don't have to, that's fine, but I... Uh, Tom Beretta with GFL. Uh, I understand it. Uh, understand about. Remember, this is just about this question. Just so I understand. Can only answer this question. But I mean, our, people are 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 an important asset, and when we have an issue that's a service issue, okay, um, if they get to customer service in real time. The customer service takes a complaint and sends it out to the supervisor. He had that is supposed to be closed that day. So if it was a missed pickup, he should go there, make sure it was picked up, take a picture, send it to his his uh, his supervisor or our, his operations manager. So that that should be done the same day. Now, if if somebody was missed and pulls it in, then you know we'll we'll, we'll go there the next week and be in that area so we make sure that it's out on time and he'll take a picture that it is there and that it was serviced. So that's, I mean, it, it just depends. If it comes early in the day, it'll be done right away. Somebody calls at four or five o'clock at night, then if nobody is here, then it'll be done the, the very next day. We have a dedicated supervisor and that's his responsibility. And his, the, his drivers have a, a direct line to him to check on anything, whether it's a late set or a mess or somebody has damaged a, a cart or a container. So it should be same-day same service. Just a quick follow-up. Almost this, all the time. This route supervisor you're talking about, or, or dedicated supervisor, is this person driving around a pickup truck you have a truck the neighborhoods? You, you've always had a dedicated supervisor that's in the township every day, all day. I see a GFL pickup truck driving that, around. That's, that's him. him, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you all. I, I do want to say one thing: is is, it, is 
um, you know, I have great respect for the work of this committee um, and the work that you've done, and it's the, your recommendation is highly valuable. It comes from a great amount of work and experience, and um, thank you for doing all of this. Thank you also for allowing the people who are not on the committee to, to really ask a lot of questions and, and go through this. It's an important topic, and, and I know we all have the same goal in mind, which is you know, superior service at the best price. Um, and uh, so thank you. Thanks to the committee um, and staff who worked on this. Sure, you don't have any more questions because I think you're, you're trying to make sure you have all your questions answered so we can get. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have any other, more, so any other questions. So, so we can move along. So we can move, yeah. <laughs> That's it. No more questions from me. So you, you have made a decision in your head that we could move forward on or do you have more questions? <laughs> I've made a decision in my head, I think. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Would you like to ask another question? Uh, no. no. Three minutes more, we break two hours on this right. one. <laughs> so Thank you for all the No work. problem. If there are no other questions, uh, is anybody prepared to make a motion? Just be to move to, to adapt the final. Would anybody be interested in making a motion based on Noah's recommendation? I'll make a motion that we um, go ahead and approve the solid waste contract as presented by NOAA. And adapt his final recommendation. And adopt the final recommendation. A motion by Trustee Fiki. Support. Support by Trustee Murray. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Opposed. No. I feel like Lee Corso, you know, <laughs> game day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, so do you need a roll call vote, or do you think you got that one? Uh, with five to two. Shostak and Barnett. Barnett, yeah. No. Okay, so that the does, rest are I. That does pass five to two. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, both of Thank you, for you. coming Thank tonight. You. All right, so now we go on to our <laughs> next agenda item, which is also NOAA is uh, introducing the proposed 2023-24 water and sewer rates. I'm gonna run over our facilities. Yeah, do you mind if we take just two minutes to no go problem. for the rest? I love another water. <laughs> back to now the NOAA show. <laughs> Second act is going to be introducing the, the proposed 2023-24 water and sewer rates. Yep. All right, so I'm back before you to introduce the water and sewer rates and, the, and I will give you a look at what I'm proposing for the actual rates, uh, but this is just an introduction. So next um, board meeting, I'll be back to uh, process any comments that we hear tonight and come to you with the final rates. I'll explain why the deadline is a hard deadline at the end of the month here as we kind of get rolling. So uh, first, I want to give you the acronyms, W, water and sewer. O&M is operations and maintenance. That's really the big portion of the costs for O&M are the costs that the township can um, change or has control over. MEU is the meter equivalency unit. FF is the fixed fee. Our billing unit is 1,000 gallons. I'll explain why that's important a little later because a lot of the other communities use uh, 1,000 cubic feet, which is much different than 1,000 gallons. CIP is a capital improvement project. Uh, Evergreen Farmington Sanitary Drain, that's our uh, sewer that we utilize for sewer services. Oakland County Water Resource Commissioner is the one who operates that sewer on behalf of the township. Great Lakes Water Authority is the producer of the drinking water that we drink. And SACWA is the consortium energy entity that buys that water and then sells it back to Bloomfield Township. Um, so I wanted to set the stage, tell you where we've been over the last several years. Uh, staff recognize the complexity of the rate making process and also the diverse makeup of the board. Uh, we undertook the rates 101, if you recall, a few years ago uh, to educate you guys and kind of bring you up to a base knowledge about the rates. Then we had a rate study, we had the rate consultant in here, and then we also as staff provide ongoing education uh, for you guys on the topics kind of interest. Um, 
Last year, kind of the moves we made was to consolidate the water and sewer debt charges and the ready to serve into a single fixed fee. It also include, included that depreciation number, which went away at that point. Uh, then additionally, um, as a move to head towards fairness, the MEU uh, meter equivalency unit was used to proportionalize the impact on the system or the perceived impact on the system. Uh, key decision points for 22-23 are uh, implementation of the secondary meter uh, program, uh, fixed fees into that program. I'll be recommending those fees are not um, implemented for the program. And then we also talked about funding sources for our emergency projects and the meter replacement program. Uh, and you'll see those are in there as well. Um, And so, um, you know, the emergencies, there are uh, saw uh, projects that we undertook a couple years ago to inspect the sewers, and then we, uh, we found a bunch of issues through that saw grant. Uh, these are pipes in critical condition, and this is above and beyond our normal capital improvement program. So these are true emergencies beyond the yearly uh, projects that we have already out there. Uh, the meter program, 52% of our meters currently are 15 years or older. Um, they have moving parts that slow as they age, and so we're recommending another meter program to capture that lost water and the revenue that is we're lacking in those old meters, and then also take advantage of the technology upgrades that are out there now. Uh, I will say this meter program is a um, this is the third or fourth iteration in the history of the water department, um, and we're already at radio reads, so the smart meters, the DT in them are installing. We installed all those in 2006 and we're on to the next technology which is cell phone service um, going forward. Um, so we are subject to the cost from our, somewhat subject to the cost from our supplier uh, who pr produce or at least distribute the commodities to us. SACWA has a 4.35% increase for this year and then WRC, so there are our water provider and then our sewer provider WRC has a 58 to 7.8% increase. So those costs are always going up uh, and we, um, you know, our distance and elevation from the source, which I'll talk about, uh, impacts this rate that we receive from our supplier. The level we, the level we pump on our highest day uh, impacts that too. And so that's what brings in the irrigation factor into the equation. Just point out as well that our uh, fiscal years do not line up with uh, Great Lakes Water, SACWAs, or WRCs. So we're kind of unique, that just presents a few challenges. So, um, so I talked about the customer profile. Um, overall, our usage has been declining since the 80s, or since the late 90s. Um, this is due to conservation uh, in the homes, of conservation products installed in homes, plus a kind of a green movement in conservation where people are using water just less uh, per person in a household. Uh, then you talk about the rate, uh, the factors that go into the rates. First is that unit of measure. Um, you know, one cubic foot of water is 7.48 gallons, right? So when you talk about a thousand cubic feet versus our unit of a thousand gallons, there's a big difference there, right? So that has to be considered. Um, additionally, we're over 30 miles from the source in this case, and the farther you are from Detroit, the more you pay. Uh, and the higher you go uphill, there's a difference of 250 feet in elevation between where we are here and where Detroit, where the plant is down in Detroit. So it costs money, extra money, for them to distribute that water up here and they pass on that to us. Additionally, I talked about our max day and peak hour. They charge us based on the, amount, the maximum amount we can take in a day and then the maximum hour within that day. It's always, June or July because it's driven by irrigation and wet, wet 
you know, wet condition or, or watering, or high use of water. Um, but the thought behind that is Detroit or Sakwa in this case has to be prepared to send us the maximum amount of water that we can take in any given time frame, right? So that's why it's set up like that. Dish, uh, distance and elevation key plus flow data. Um, if we had the capacity to build containers here to contain the water, we would be able to impact our rate, but we would have to build about nine million gallons of containment, and we don't have the space for that. So when I talk about flow data, when you build containment, you basically are shifting that high consumption from a, like an early morning when everybody's getting up to take a shower, you would run it out of your tanks, and then then you would fill up in the late night time frame when they don't have a high usage. Thereby, you kind of play with your max day peak hour by offsetting that. All right. Um, we have 1,500 and f uh, 15,500 water and sewer customers total. Um, 15,000 residents, so highly residential. Uh, we do have a few outliers, sewer only customers. Uh, the secondary meter program encompasses about 3,200 program participants at this point, and we also have 2,600 water only customers. So our sewer only customers, there's two community wells in the township that um, still operate them privately and separate of the township. That's your sewer only customers, their water is not available. Then the 2,600, those are septic customers that are on our water system. Um, so we have all different kinds. I know like Danny, you, you're not on the water or sewer system period, right? So, but we, so we do have a significant amount of septics out there and a smaller amount of uh, private well people out there. So um, for the things that we do control, the capital improvement and the level of service, those are the things that drive our O&M activities, right? We have a desired level of service. Stephanie, you were on the committee that formed the asset management plan that set our level of service that we provide. Certainly, we could make a decision as a board to say we're not going to fix water main breaks as fast, right? But is that the level of service that we want to provide for our customers? It's not the level of service I want to provide, right? <laughs> so level of service drives that amount of investment that you want to make into the system through your capital improvement project drives your rates as well. And people often ask, why are your rates so much different than another community adjacent, right? And it's, it's multi-factored. Rates are homegrown. Distance and elevation is key. Usage, usage patterns drive, and how good do they take care of their system? You know, that's just a few of the points that can make, well, and, and like I told you earlier, the units straight up, they could be charging in a different unit, right? Liters of gasoline versus gallons of gasoline. You're gonna have a big difference there, right? Um, additionally, just this slide kind of illustrates that we don't have a big commercial uh, customer base to EA either couch costs in as higher users. In fact, I would draw your attention to this last line here, which in our highest usage category, which is over 100 units in quarterly usage, we have about the same number of commercial entities, 108, as residential entities. Hmm. So our biggest user using over a hundred units per quarter we have just as many residences using that as like let's say Costco or Lifetime Fitness that are using water for processes right that's that's enormous irrigation usage and maybe there's a couple leaks in there <laughs> um, but, um, you know, we can't shift costs to commercial, where in a bigger industrial area that has a big business base, you might be able to do that, right? Um, we're very residential focused, and that's why the fairness, we have to look for other avenues as how to make, uh, you know, equity or fairness within our rates. Uh, just a summary of where we've been and where we're going, right? March 16th was the study session where I really got to the details of what you guys were looking for for our decision points for this year. Uh, now I'm introducing the rates, kind of giving you the a little bit more of the background, but letting you, giving you your first look at what the rates will look like and what our thought process is behind them. Then I will be back on April 24th to hopefully have like a two-slide deal that shows you the rates and says recommend 
when do you approve them, right? So this is really the opportunity for me to, to hear any feedback on the proposed rates to make an adjustment and you can see that we're up against a deadline uh, because really these rates go into effect April 1st, but in a quirk of the billing, we don't have to have the bills out until the end of April, so that gave us this month that we're working in right now. So there basically allows us some lag time to get this done since we got budget and everything that kind of crowd out this, this area. So more assumptions. I talked about the lowering uh, the, the volume of usage going down, right? This is a trend. I think we pegged it at right around 2.5% decline in, in usage. That'll level out at some point. So we have to be careful and kind of keep assessing that and look for when we've hit the bottom of that. Um, you know, certainly there becomes a level when efficiency has reached its maximum and you have just what usage per person that you can kind of plan on. Ad additionally, we assumed we were going forward with the MEU-based rate system. Uh, we continued our focus and our level of service that we all feel like we need to invest in our water system, right? So a continued focus on capital and replacing our infrastructure out there. Meter program, meter is our infrastructure. It's our methodology for getting bills and consumption and telling us about our system, plus our long-term reserve goals. Um, and you'll see why that's important because we're talking this year about bringing our reserve levels down to those goals that we all set last year as part of the rate making endeavor that we went out on. Um, but it's important to note that there are goals for our reserves and um, like we're going to show this year, we are comfortable walking the walk, right, and spending down to those goals if we have emergency projects and it's prudent, right? So, um, let's see. Uh, so then I just kind of walk you through the nuts and bolts of what is involved in this rate process, right? And it's taking your commodity prices, adding in the township's cost for O&M, then adding in our capital improvement and our debt, right? So this gets at our level of service and our capital improvement project or program and how progressive and aggressive we're gonna be in replacing old pipes. And that all comes together to tell us how much revenue is gonna be required in a given year, right? And then this process on its face is pretty simple, right? But then once you kind of bring the human factor in, it's complicated by life, policies, level of service, emergencies, just the weather, right, is a big impact that we have absolutely no control over that even if we do the best job in the world of estimating the revenue requirements out, if we get more rain than historically we've gotten, we're gonna sell less water. So that's just a kind of to show the push and pull factors that we're working with and many of them are out of our control. Right? Uh, then that all goes over the amount of volume that we're going to sell, right? Projected volume we're going to sell for a year. So in a paradigm where your projected sales volume is going down, you're going to pay higher rates as a result because the denominator is smaller and then it results in a higher rate, right? Um, so life complicates this. Our policies as a board, um, the act, the work of Wayne Dominey and Olivia and now Corey to um, bolster our system, make sure we've got a system where we don't see the things that you see in other communities about A, boil waters, Brighton this week, um, or wa and, and boil waters are a fact of life in a water system, but they're an indicator of better or worse maintenance, right? I'm not saying anything against Brighton, but you will have more boil water alerts if you don't take care of your system because you'll have more breaks, right? Uh, additionally, um, proactive putting pipe in the ground, that type of thing. We don't want to be where like you've seen it with other communities to the south of here where they let it run for a few weeks before they get out and repair it, right? That's lost water, that's poor service, that's all those, I mean, it's not the way a water system should be run, right? So all those things are built in, baked into our rate just intrinsically. 
Um, so total expenses, we got our increases from SACWA. We have good news there, which I'll show you as we go forward. Uh, then our fixed fee, which those are all kind of incorporated in it. So now depreciation has gone away. Our capital is funded as part of that fixed fee as a portion of it and a portion of my township O&M expenses. Um, so that's kind of how your operations and maintenance and your capital converge into your fixed fee, right? That's my O&M level of service that we provide on the system, plus our capital, our improvements that we want to do going forward, that's all baked into that fixed fee or a portion of it, right? And that's how you arrive at our revenue requirement in the end. Um, touching on each one of these factors in a little more detail. Um, DPW, so this is, my, this is my guys, right? This is the work. You want to think water main breaks. You want to think sewer backups, two in the morning. Who's the face you see? It's a Bloomfield Township employee. O&M, it's system repair, operations and maintenance, manhole inspections, cross-connection program that I know everyone loves. Um, inventory of our lead has become a... Um, a uh, interesting uh, talking point because A, it's a regulatory requirement, right? So we're required to do stuff by the federal government and they don't fund it. So we have to fund those things through our O&M budget. Uh, we also have a consent judgment out uh, because we exceed our town outlet capacity and we have to conform with rules and requirements of that um, policy or, or that agreement. Um, Plus, we have just various work. I have uh, about a $1.2 million split between water and sewer that does this type of O&M work throughout the year. We find a leaker. Um, again, um, we're over our town outlet capacity, so it behooves us to limit infiltration into the sewer system because we have to pay for that. So part of DPW's operations is to limit that I&I &I infiltration into the system because we're all paying for that, right? So. Uh, tightening up the system. Uh, then it's the water. You know, where do we get our commodity? Who do we purchase it from and why? So our options are limited. Uh, we, we have very good abundant water over in Lake St. Clair and Lake Huron, but to build a pipe or a treatment plant is not feasible at this time, right? So we're kind of stuck with getting water from Detroit. I think Flint is a good case study in that when they tried to build their own pipeline out to the lake and all the issues that occurred as part of that, which is a very big big story, a saga, really. Um, but we're very limited in who we buy our resources from. And we have made steps to limit our costs, right? We buy our water instead of, we used to buy it from Great Lakes Water, um, and, or DWSD at the time. Then we entered into an agreement as associate member with SACWA and we take advantage of their containment. They have a lot of containment in Royal Oak behind their facilities and within their system, right? And so we've been able to take advantage of that containment and thereby receive a lower rate. Plus we're part of a consortium so we're treated as a much bigger mouth at the hose for a, uh, you know, for a good example of it. We're, we're a hungrier mouth at the table, so we command a better price because we're a bigger customer when we buy as part of a consortium. And we stopped keeping track four or five years ago, but it was in the tens of millions of dollars that were saved over the life of that, uh, that relationship. Then we distribute the water to our township customers, and sewage is treated by Oakland County on the way out. Right, so estimate of uh, sales volume, all that kind of, you'll see how that comes into play, right? Um, here is that trend that I alluded to. Um, you can see it is a clear line of regression. Um, next year, 2021, and hopefully we can get 22 on there because you'll see the impact of weather. You can kind of see it right now uh, with the wet years resulting in lower sales and the dry years resulting in more sales, right? And so all, to make the best guess here, you can put that linear regression line in there and you basically determine how, you know, that is the true reality of the water usage story, right? We are declining in usage and it is very obvious. And that's an industry trend overall. That's, there has been a limiting, and it again, probably construction standards, then the green movement, I would say, if 
who's responsible. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so then we talked about the project considerations that we had this year. Club Drive, um, it's a drop connection into a manhole. It's right where Club Drive hits Ayrshire and it's all wetland through there. So um, a sewer and roadway that was built on top of muck and marl. Uh, there was a connection going into the manhole and that connection is dropped off and is basically no longer made there, right? So that's a eminent hazard. It already has failed. So that, and it's a costly project. That was exposed by the SAW grant. Um, Brafferton, I can't remember the details there. Um, Forest Lake is a sewer that runs adjacent to another repair we made in about 2007. It runs down by the tennis courts on Forest Lake Country Club property. And um, it, Basically, where it traverses under the tennis courts, the pipe has either slipped off the pilings or it's been crushed on top of the pilings. So we need to excavate that area, much like Long Lake Road. We may be able to reuse the pilings, but we may not. So we're trying to determine that right now. Um, but that's going to be a bad project because it's right next to, it's about 15 feet from Forest Lake. Um, luckily, it's kind of a man-made man augmented lake, so it doesn't have the muck and marl going up into the Forest Lake Country Club property, so it'll be a little easier. Um, but it is tough with a lake 25 feet away, and we're going to have about a 20, 30-foot hole there. Um, so expensive project. Club Drive, a lot of impacts. Club Drive closed. Um, I think Brafferton was another sewer slipping off pilings too. So you kind of see a theme to these emergency projects as <coughs> mucky areas where they install a pipe on pilings and then those pilings fail. So then there's the meter replacement program. Again, 52% of our meter stock is 15 years or older right now. Um, we've done, this is a cyclical routine maintenance program within water departments. This is our revenue generator within the water department. So we have a duty to make sure that accurately reflects the water coming into the facility. Um, again, it's cyclical. We've been, this has been our third or fourth iteration in the um, meter replacement program paradigm for the township. Um, we already have the radio read devices in place, uh, which, you know, when DTE switched to smart meters or what they called smart meters, that's the technology that we're replacing now. So they've already been in place, uh, the radio read technology. We're going over to a cellular read and it'll ping for like four seconds throughout the day to deliver the packets of information. So instead of a radio signal being sent out all the time, you've got the packets of information going out four times a day in a very short uh, cell phone package. Um, plus, this allows us to get take advantage of these technological advances both in leak detection, uh, customer service, um, billing. Uh, we want to study and get statistics about our billing and our usage trends with our people. This will, you know, that data will uh, allow us to achieve all those things. And it's not exclusive to going out and do monthly billing at that point, but it will give us the tools if we decide to go that way to give that benefit. Um, additionally, what I think are the real big customer service benefits will be the leak detection instead of us reading the meter three months later and you've had a leak going for three months, we'll be able to catch it like night of when the leak starts. So we'll be able to send notices out, do our site visits that, um, you know, I know Mike, you know how the leak detection process can draw out when you have to kind of wait three months for the data to come in. So, the you know, it'll put people in the driver's seat a little bit more, the, the portal and the... Um, avenue for the customers to come in and look at the data and their usage trends is going to be far improved by the data that we're going to be able to get out of these this new technology so um let me see here and yeah, i don't have any i thought i had maybe had a note about brafferton what that was so Corey, is that the one we were talking about today Corey, brafferton do you um, have details on that he said he's trying to figure out what that is is that the one I, with the... I even asked Corey for an update, Corey Borton for an update, but it just <laughs> slipped my mind now. Yeah, I'm struggling to remember. <laughs> Is that the one in the village? Yeah, Karen, yeah, get up here. Karen's here. You're probably the yeah. one who told me originally. Yeah. <laughs> 
Karen Stickle from HRC, who is our engineer. Hi, everyone. So Brafferton is a sewer that was actually televised by the township staff originally. It wasn't part of the SAW grant. It's over in the... Um, and they found it's in some rear yards in a very wet area. It's not actually on piles, but there's a major sag in the sewer. It's no longer on grade. So there's concerns about backups and clogs in that pipe because things can gather in that major sag. So we need to dig that up and fix it. It's going to be a pretty expensive project. Like I said, it's in rear yards. It's going to affect some driveways. Um, so not an easy fix. <laughs> because they never are. Right. So, thank you. Thanks. And you know, I'll dovetail in that, you know, when you have a high level of service and you're looking and televising sewers out there, you're going to find issues, right? So, um, hopefully I'm not back here next year talking about the more 6 million dollars more of issues that we found, right? But that is a possibility, right? And then we have to make decisions about our reserves and about our programs going forward to fit that level of service. I'd rather you be here telling us you found some things you want to fix than waiting till they break. Oh, certainly. And having stuff would, in people's That's homes. the way I run my system, I too. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, Agreed. I'm happy to work for a community that sees the value of providing the level of service that I believe people should expect out there, right? So I don't think you should expect to turn on the tap and nothing comes out. So, right. And this community is committed to being better than that. So, um, so cash reserves, uh, we're going to look to you guys again, this is nothing new, to fund the emergency projects that we have out there and additionally the first year of the meter program through our reserves that we've built up. Um, you know, uh, there's some things that have helped uh, create this surplus a little bit in here. Um, one of those is COVID and the inability to get that capital improvement project stuff kicked off and going in the last few years has been very difficult. So we've been unable to spend like the three million that we put away for capital projects. Additionally, we had um, really wet year, but then we followed by a really dry year last year. So when we look at our, trying to project our amount we're gonna consume, we under projected last year because we had a very hot, we had an extreme drought that we all experienced here in, in Metro Detroit. So that resulted in a abnormally up. The way we've set out our abnormal amount of revenue, which has allowed us to use that for these things, right? And you'll see why we have been able to even mitigate the rate that SACWA has charged us by using some of these cash reserves. So, and I'll, I'll kind of show you that in a little bit. But the, we're in a fortunate um, position that, you know, we do have the money to fund these right now. I think we have all set the goals and they're prudent for our reserve levels. So I recommend we go down to our goals that we all set as part of our cash reserves uh, to fund these projects. Um, so um, this, the fiscal conservative nature of the way that we are setting rates, additionally weather impacts over the last five years has allowed us to recommend a 2.5% increase to water rates and a 3.5% increase to sewer rates. So you'll see that we've been able to cut away at the rate increases that SACWA and WRC has proposed to us. And that is again because we had the dry year and we have a little bit that we couldn't spend from the CIP and reserves. So we were able to knock down their rate increases to us to equal a 2.5% increase in water and a 3.5% increase in sewer rates, right? What, what were their rate increases again? It was 5.8 to 7.8 in WRC's case, and then SACWA was a 4.35% increase. So right there, I want to state it again, due to CIP not being able to spend the money in prior years and having the COVID effect, and then additionally due to the dry year that we had last year, that resulted in a little additional revenue that we've been able to offset those rate increases from our suppliers. So originally until we ran the numbers and got down to the percentages, we thought we were going to just match those increases and be good because we didn't add any on as the township end because we're going to fund 
fund our emergency projects out of reserves, so we re ostensibly didn't add on our end, but we've actually been able to mitigate the increases from our suppliers, right? Additionally, our recommendation is based on our study session and, and uh, the kind of de facto vote that we had here at that study session, we would recommend implementing no fixed fee for the secondary meter program participants. Uh, we would utilize that $7 million in surplus cash funds to fund the sewer, emergency sewer projects in the first year of that replacement. Again, as I warned in the um, study session, we're going to have to come back next year and look at year two, year three of that meter replacement program. And if there's not money in reserves, we'll have to fund that either through the rates. We'll be coming back with that question next year. It is a three-year program based on the ability of the contractor to ramp up and do the work over that three-year period. Now, so, could I ask you a quick question? Um, clarification on the no fixed fee for secondary meter program participants so that includes those existing participants and future correct participants correct so there'll be no fee whatsoever correct. Okay. until like in a later date a board could decide to go right. the other way but yes. right at this As point a, that's what I'm hearing okay. that's what I'm reading in the Great. tea leaves and okay, yeah. thank you so yep <laughs> really by the time we do get to I know some people have said I don't want to be charged for MEU or for this I want usage that's why we're doing these replacements on the meters so you can get charged based on your usage and not based on fixed fees. Or at least the gather system. the data so right. that the board can make an informed decision about what rate structure right. they want to see going forward. Yeah. Uh, no, it's an ever-evolving thing. Right. Noah, something you and I talked about was I know we decided not to implement the fixed fee on the secondary meter program, but the secondary meter people purchased and, and paid to install those initially, and the township in general replaces meters at our cost and so we're not doing the fee but is it reasonable in fairness to say when those secondary meters get replaced that those residents have to repurchase the new meter and a modest install that fee? could certainly be discussed what I would say is the math and the science is back that it will make us w the consumption will underread enough to pay for that meter from the township's perspective from the 15 to 20 year lifespan. So it behooves the township regardless to pay for that meter. So regardless of what the board decides, some fair share type uh, agreement or skin in the game type of thing, um, we could get you the numbers on what the meters cost and all that, but it is a benefit to the township to replace mm -hmm. that meter just so we're accurately reflecting the, the right. water and, that goes and that's, through. I mean, to pay for to have residents pay for those meters is a very small right it's like a token of more fairness than it is really and, and you know, it's uh, in line with generator. our uh, all the other like when you build a new house the builder has to pay for the meter so it's nobody gets a free one until when you're in the system and then you basically the system pays for that meter going forward then and it is a bet you, know, you could charge a nominal fee based on the lifespan of the meter and the you know the age that type of thing and where you think it's going to go but it is a benefit to the township to accurately reflect that water so there's benefits anyway so thank you yep so this is the look at the rates, right? This is that those 2.5% and 3.5% increases uh, played out in the rates. You see the current rate and also the rate that's proposed there. Um, you know, I think it speaks to the nature of how we've planned for these rates and how we're thinking about them, uh, that we've even got a little bit of extra revenue to offset some rates with. Right? I think it's a testament to kind of the conservative nature of the planning and, and it's, I mean, a testament to, in reality, how dry it was last year, but. Do you know what the numbers are of uh, how many percent, if you took the five eighths of three quarters and the one inch, how much percentage of our users that is? Katie. 80% are under, no. or one inch or under? I thought it was a little less than that. What's the percentage? Oh, he I said Katie. Katie. Katie, can you come back up? <laughs> I thought he said 80. I'm like, I back thought it was up. less than that. <laughs> the percentage in that three quarter, five eighths, and one inch category so, how many uh, of our customers that cover. And oh. it would be lovely at the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you're right. He's got it. It's approximately, yeah, like 80%. So it is 80%. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So 80%, whether it's residential or commercial, is under. Or is it 80% of residential? 
Ooh. I don't know the distinction. Okay. So you may Either be, way, even if it's commercial, it's <laughs> such I a small it's, makeup yeah, of our whole. Okay. It, it's it's really the commercial is such a small share of our whole. The large majority make. is under that one. Yep, inch. Okay. yep. We're hitting the honey hole, and that and really five eighths, three quarters, and one inch. They're considered the same thing, uh, right? We're reaching the target. <laughs> oh, I don't want to even target, know what that means. Right? Uh, yeah. Get the golf ball into the hole. <laughs> uh, no, I have a quick question. Are there any um, residential users that are at a three inch or, or up above? Oh yeah, I know oh, one in are. particular that's the house is being constructed right now oh. that is of that size or bigger. Okay. Yeah, and, and that kind of harkens back to my slide that shows we got as many people using 100 units, residential homes, mm -hmm. as businesses right. out there, right? Um, and then I was also curious, the allocation of the different pricing for the meter size, how did we come up with that? So it's a standard in the American Water Works Association, and it's based on the quantity of water that can f go through a pipe. So it's not double. Right, so the, well, the fallacy Oh, it's is, a factor, so it could be, you know, quarters to one and a half is there's not, not a relationship in a doubling like a one inch pipe to a two inch pipe. It's much more water can flow through a two inch pipe than, it's not a right. pure it's fact, a you know, relationship. Up. Right, right. So, and that was, and that was in our, the first slide back, or uh, that you can see those ratios. It's almost three times as much water. Yeah. But yep. the increase, for the flat fixed rate increase is not three times. It's not as, right. It's actually less than the amount of volume that the higher pipe is capable of. Correct. Yep. But if we did switch to a usage, just to confirm, which, which, which we are to. aiming towards, usage not size, somebody who, let's say that somebody has one of these much larger homes. So they're going to have that one and a half to, some of the homes I'm seeing probably have even higher based on how large these homes are. If they're not using it, if we end this, all right, goal is to get towards usage, not towards size. There is a way to switch from this to the usage. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean. So, and that's the purpose of this meter replacement program. Well, to, get, uh, to help us get there. Well, I want to be clear, the, the real purpose and the reason you do the three pass meter programs that we did. Sorry, are, meter upgrade with the new technology. Right, the technology okay. will allow it's us to study meter, that, yeah. right. But the reason we're putting in new meters is to accurate, accurately reflect the water going through the pipe. But the cell phone technology that's replacing the smart meters Will allow, will allow us, us to us. aim towards usage, so this yep. wouldn't be a factor right. as much. Right. Or Depending on what the future board, yeah, okay. I mean, you could design the rate to incorporate a little bit of that in it, and then the rest is usage. It's oh, for right. It's you could go to a purely usage. You could do a. Be in trouble. You could do like a cutoff where if you use less than 200 units, you're cons or, or 40 units, you're a low user. Then if you go above that, you're more. Okay. It will open. The data is necessary to even even make an educated guess at this point. And just to and piggybacking on that, to be clear, my understanding is the meter replacements are being done as, as the age of the meter justifies it. Correct. The transmission p part is, is being replaced uh, on an accelerated basis so that we could get to, we have the data necessary to get to a, a usage-based system. Yes. So we're not putting good money after bad and replacing meters replacing that have only all been meters, in replacing right, all two the years. Part. I think that has been put out there that, that there's a, fe uh, a concept that we're putting all brand new meters in for this and we need to, you know, no matter how many times you say it, it helps, is it's the technology that's being added to some that are not being replaced. Correct. So the, the meter system that's in a home is made up of three parts. There's the meter itself, there's the head on the meter that reads the moving part inside the meter, then there's a transmitter portion which transmits that data. In the case where the meter head and meter body are not of age to replace them, we will replace the, the radio read head with a cellular read head to get those benefits. And we will wait until we, I mean in a real paradigm of this we should re be replacing like 10% a year and make the program go over 10 years or 15 and break it down to where you're replacing like 7 or 8% a year and you never end the program, right? Because then you don't have a glut of 16,000 meters or 8, eight 9,000 of them that have to be replaced in a two-year period, right? So that's where we'd like to get to. We'd also like to get to um, 
pulling meters and testing them on a basis so that we can have actual usage numbers um, so we can then hone and uh, you know that's important because the new meters we're going to are ultrasonic there are no moving parts so probably what's going to fail in those is the electronics and i don't know when whereas the nutating disc we can kind of if we know what our water quality is we can tell how fast that disc is going to wear down so it'll be it's important that we gather our data because nobody really knows how long a ultrasonic meter will last so well, and there's the a warranty period though right oh yeah, yeah. it's 25 well, we, years on a warranty uh, but you know you tell me you know a lot of people have vhs recorders that still work right that are electronic device but you know they weren't warrantied for more than two years so but i don't know that i can bet on that right so that's why we got to collect the data you know that's why paul's going to be testing a lot of meters when, <laughs> when and another it item that's out there just to clarify too is we already have smart meters yeah. i know some people are worried that we're putting in a, a technology that there's some fear base around we're taking that out and replacing it with basically what's in your hand right we've had hand. radio reads okay. in the township which is what dte calls a smart meter right. uh, we've had radio reads in the township since like 06 and earlier that was part of our last upgrade right. um the new it's it's a cellular based that's all in the non-ionizing frequencies right. for for waves right so it's um not even in the category of a microwave or an x-ray right. which have ionizing they can cause mutations and dna and that type of stuff they are not in the ionizing threshold um and they've been studied they meet all the government regulations if you trust that mm -hmm. um you know so they are not in the ionizing um um, uh, category of wavelengths that would cause known problems and mutations. Okay. So, and they, the cellular system, the way it works, it's not always just pinging the data out there. It sends the packets like four times a day. These are like millisecond communications between the device and the uh, home base. So. So it's not like it's blanketing a signal 24/7 out there, you know. It's right. it's much shorter than any phone call that we you would make on a cell phone. Sorry. Uh, so there's the proposed rates. Um, what I would say is, any comments you want to get to me, I want to, you know, if I don't hear anything and and this looks good, uh, I believe we have a very strong proposal. I've uh, not been part of a rate where we've uh, not had to kind of pass along the increase from our uh, our vendors. So I think that's significant. I think it's a um, uh, an outward sign of what we're doing. Uh, you know, we're not skimping and cutting corners on our level of service to do this right this is a uh, benefit of um, being prudent in how you uh, plan for rates and how you look at it I think it's a testament to the people who have come before me uh, and handled these rates um, so I think that's significant um, but I'd, I'd solicit any comment the plan would be back here uh, April 25th and basically have like a two slide show for you that says you know here's the rates here's when they'll become effective um, so absent hearing anything uh, we will move forward with those recommendations so. It's actually April 24th, right? You said, yep. you said April 25th, yeah. just oh, for the record. Nope, 24th. Yep. <laughs> Two weeks from tonight. Well, Definitely. tonight for another Yeah, hour. well, I, I just want to... Um, <laughs> we to, can wait. <laughs> okay, so I just want to note that, uh, you know, obviously we've heard a lot of resident feedback about the meter equivalency unit, and I've kind of gone um, back and forth with it myself. Uh, originally, really, this came to us from Raftelis, and there are so many different variables that we can use. And uh, now I'm kind of at, of the mind that, you know, we switch from the residential, the, the REU, the residential equivalency unit, in part trying to get towards a more equitable rate. And ultimately, I think the goal is the, the tiered rating, which we've all heard we have to work towards. And I guess really what I'm trying to get at is I think in our effort to do that, what we've done instead is you have a substantial number of people who are getting a savings, but it's a relatively, you could say nominal savings. And then you have people who at the two inch or even one and a half inch are seeing 
not I, it's not nominal but a relatively higher increase um, so that concerns me and then even just looking at and w which was why I was questioning how we're allocating the the price from the five eighths the three fourths up to the two inch is because I mean you look at somebody with a three fourth and just for water they're paying twenty nine dollars and eighty five cents and then if you have the two inch pipe you're at one hundred and thirty seven dollars and sixty eight cents and I completely understand as far as the capacity and the system and um, you know being able to use that additional amount of water but I don't know that we're meeting our goal by using this so uh, and I know you have done a lot of work and your staff has done a lot of work to come up with these numbers and it's great that we don't have to pass on um, the increases that we're getting from our service providers but I'm curious uh, if we do want to stick with the MEU if we can adjust so I understand that they're standard numbers but can we adjust those numbers to so it is based on a national standard. What I would say is um, this was the first step towards that fairness, right? And we used to charge everyone the same, right? So, um, and it's important that when there's winners in this decision, there's also losers. We have a finite number of people. So if you change the way you proportionate those costs, someone's going to pay. The only way to get savings is for someone else to pay more. So um, what I would caution against is going away from a national standard that's in the M1 manual put out by AWWA because that would open us up to, we would want to justify that enormously so that we don't end up in court again sure, so well, it's and this was a first step towards it right yes. and so the reason that one inch three quarters and five eighths are grouped together is our minimum now is one inch but before all the way across the board they were at the same level so it was it, it, it does achieve that goal but there are winners and losers uh, and in this case the you know again that one and a half inch population seems to be out there because that's that tipping point where you go from like a residential and it's and it's the one and a half inches with very low usage right that's who's really feeling the pain um, those are not arbitrary decisions when the uh, service line goes into the house they don't just say hey if one inch is better one and a, or one inch is good one and a half inch is better right these are uh, engineered systems that come into the house that are built in a way that feeds the needs of that house so it's you know even we've had five or six people call us and say well I want to switch my service line and I'm like, well, fine, you can do that, but I would recommend you call a plumber and make sure you're not going to orphan your third floor bathroom and not have water pressure to get up to that level, right? There was a reason why they built your house with that level of a system in it. And I, so I can't make that decision on whether they can downsize or not. And I've never had one of those people come back and say, yeah, the plumber said we could do it, so let's make it happen. Right, so what that says to me is those five or six, and these were all secondary meter people, they explored it, they vetted it, and it's not an option, right? And so buying, and there might be one-offs out there where somebody was a builder and they built the house so they had material or whatever, but the extra cost from a builder's point of view doesn't justify a want when it's not needed for the construction of the home. So I would say it's not perfect by any means, but it's our first step towards fairness and um, it and there's more to come, right? So it's an evolving situation. Um, and you know to some extent if a builder put a bigger size in there and someone else bought the house then you are subject to that because it is a kind of a fact to the system when you buy in so and one good thing about sticking with the national standards is since we did have to fight a lawsuit all the way toward you know to the supreme court and it costs over a million dollars to win that those same people are also suggesting again to sue the water so the one reason that we are not having that issue is we are following standards, which once we get to that, that's why we're all so quickly trying to get to usage-based tiered, because that's also a standard. So we don't we can have get. an arbitrary rate, right. which is very if we fig if, I'm just scared that if we pick something that is arbitrary, now we actually have given something for them to, exactly. to, to be. Yeah. 
And, you know, if, oddly enough, we were sued and the township was prevailed in that. So the yeah. court determined that the way that the rates were um, set was was lawful. And so then it just kind of had me thinking, maybe let's just stick with the REU and move forward with that. But yeah, I, I, I would caution against, you know, this, the flip flopping back and forth, right? Because then you create that inequity, you create some problems. We need to kind of, just like we need to stay the course with our capital improvement project and our goals for the system, we need to stay focused on what our end game is here, and that's working towards fairness conservation depending on your point of view right and and all these things right so i think as much as even usage or equity might drive maybe conservation will drive as well right and it seems to be like the even our rate consultant will say most people who do a tiered rate it's to drive down consumption and it's literally that's the focus that they're gold on so we're not that's not necessarily our goal i think we need to kind of look within ourselves and us as staff get it out of us what our true goal is right and the manual's that thick and there's 200 different ways to, that have been vetted to charge right so us educating you guys ourselves on those and what that looks like that's the key there and just kind of vetting out what the like letting you know i had like when we make a decision this is what the impact will be right so that we try to get ahead of that so no would there be any correlation between when you get into residential that has a one and a half or a two inch pipe like you said it wasn't arbitrary because there's a second or third story but is there also a correlation that those might be people that tend to have irrigation systems and secondary meters? So on the off side of that, you know, we are we changed the plan to charge extra for the secondary meters. So there's a little bit of balancing of fairness in that as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, we know what the sizes are because we provide the meters, so we'd be able to tell the relationship between that secondary meter and the pipe coming in. Uh, what I would generally say is, yes, those ones with the more robust sprinkler systems are going to have those higher. There's no way right. somebody's using 100 units of water and has a three-quarter inch meter, let's say. Right. right, so you're going. They're going to categorize themselves up just so, naturally. I mean, again, there might be a little bit of balancing there in some of the fairness that you know, the the larger pipe size did bring their water rates up, but not charging. Right. Well, and that's where I, meter. you know, a paradigm like consumers or DTE, where you're either considered a low user or a normal user, then there's an excessive user. Right? Is that the <laughs> type of like uh, you know, you use up to 300 kilowatt hours, you're a normal person. Beyond that, you're an excessive user and you're gonna pay the rate for that, right? That's intrinsically like you're creating a divide there between low and high users, right? But that's some equity because you're giving them an allowance for the, the water we need to live, right? The drinking water and the bathing water, then you're considering irrigation to be extra and you charge extra for that, right? There's a paradigm out there for that. Then there's also the 10 tiers and if you graduate up to the 10th one, you pay the highest, right? Right? That's another way to do it. So but that's something people have control over. They don't necessarily yep. have control over. They move into a home and it has a pipe. Certainly. So that's so if on in a perfect world and we could continue this this meter upgrade at the pace that if the contractor could do this, does that mean we're about two to three years max? Well, we'll away need three from years that? to get through the program. Okay. Right. Then I would say the rate year needs to happen just so we can have the consultant in here and work us through that process. So four or five years if everything goes good. Three. Well three to get it done, <laughs> then we need another year to actually go through rates. So if you're talking so really four, four maybe four. five, because I don't know I haven't seen a construction project well, go I'll to take schedule. Three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're, We're working towards it as one. fast as we can. As, but the, the hazard we of we can get there the faster yep. that it, that's our goal too. It is more fair because if people have control over their what they do, that's better than moving yeah. into a home that we understand that that is a driver of this. You know, again, beyond the um, being accurate and the uh, you know the metering of the water, that is a benefit that's out there that we want to realize, right? And we're already going to pay for the equipment, so we might as well realize it as quick as possible. Yeah. What I want to do is make sure that the um, whoever we have in that's crunching the numbers has a statistically significant sample size so that we don't end up in front of Judge O'Brien 
I got. Right. Well, we so. can anyway at any time. Right. Well, agreed. Say, but I'd like to be. I'd not, like to manage from a perspective to limit my visits in front of the Supreme dis- Court. Fairly wide discretion <laughs> in, in setting things. We just want to make sure yep. it can yep. be dismissed easily. Right. But they are. Exactly. We just got Don't told from Raftellis they're suing <laughs> California based on their tiered rate. So just because we do a tiered rate doesn't mean we're out of the woods there either. But it behooves us to have the data in place to be comfortable. Okay. I'm sorry, but public comment no. was earlier. Sorry, but no. we, that sorry. Was before this information was presented. Yes. Correct, but we, but we will have another meeting. We aren't voting tonight. There's no vote tonight. Know, this people, is, people sir, tonight. no, Communicate. no. Um, you can see that one next door post can bring on more. There is, there are tons of people that reach out to us. I literally get 300 to 400 emails a day. I, I promise you, but wrong, okay? I. Okay, on that note, there will be, uh, at the next meeting, there'll be public comment when we vote. So, yeah. so, so I am sorry, sir, but thank you so much. Okay. Send us an email, make yep. us a phone call. We're all available, but not yep. right now. Okay. So do you have anything else now? Uh, so just that I'll be back on April 24th, 7 p.m. 24th. To recommend the rate approval. 20, correct. Two yep. weeks from today. Correct. Right. Be here or well, be square. And there will be yep. public We're comment available. Under. You can email, phone, uh, all of that. Okay. Thank you, Noah. So thank, thank you, you, Noah. Thank you, Katie. Yes. Next, we have consider the award of the 2023 through 2025 Jan Ronselli Safety Path Program contract. Yes. We have Director yes. Corey Almas. Corey, you've got a long us. wait. <laughs> Yeah, I, the I, new guy goes last. I feel like I'm being hazed. You are. <laughs> new guy goes last. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Midnight shift is next. Oh, uh, I'll try to keep this short and sweet. Um, so, uh, thank you, board. Um, the township safety path encompasses approximately 75.4 miles. Um, each year, that the engineering and environmental services department allocates funds. For the maintenance and repair of uh, maintenance and repair program to replace damaged, heaving, or settled segments of the safety path. Last year, staff identified roughly 20,450 square feet of path uh, for repairs for the 2023 safety path repair program. To help expedite the repairs and make the safety path repair program more efficient, staff proposed a multi year contract, a three year contract, to sep- and separate uh, from the new construction program. Please note that the first year uh, of the bidding specs are based on the known quantities, with the second and third years uh, are estimated quantities with no expectation or guaranteed uh, to the volume of work. Uh, Two bids were received and read on March 22nd, uh, in which Italia Construction Incorporated from Washington, Michigan was low bidder in the amount of $252,759 dollars and 69 cents for the 2023 safety path repair program. Italia also provided the low bid for the uh, potential second and third years with a total bid amount of $624,471 and 69 cents. Italia is a very good working relationship with the township and provides quality workmanship and exceptional uh, customer service. Staff recommends the board award the contract for the 2023 Safety Path Repair Program to Italia Construction Inc. from Washington, Michigan with a low bid amount of $252,759.69. Staff also recommends the board awards the year two for 2024 and year year three 2025 Safety Path Repair Program to Italia Construction should they perform the previous year's work satisfactorily by way of change order each year that matches the budget uh, approved by the Board of Trustees for each subsequent year at the unit prices identified in the bid response for the 2023 Safety Path Repair Program. Uh, Open for any questions you might have. No, I was just gonna say, Italia, they've demonstrated that they've done a good job in the township. They've been very involved in the Safety Path Program over the years, and it's nice to see that they are the low bidder, so. Very much so, the low bidder. Uh, they also, by the way, we've spoken a couple times, or at least once in detail, about some work from last year. Uh, they, you know, the fact that they, they, they are standing by that, the quality of their work. So there's some parts of the path to be replaced because of the surface imperfections. 
it happens anytime you do concrete work late in the season, but uh, but they're standing behind that. Yeah, I, um, I that's a great point. I've I've got a long history myself, knowledge and experience working relationship with Italia from my previous community, and their customer service is top notch. It always has been. How often have we approved multi-year bids? The, the last one was a multi-year. Um, was? Yeah. Okay. 20, JB, yeah. 2020, JB. JB was three years? Three yeah, three-year yeah, three contract, and 2020 was the last one that uh, I was aware of. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? If not, I look for a motion. Yes, so moved. moved. Motion by Trustee Barnett. Mm -hmm. Support. Support by Trustee Fakie. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. Uh, next, we have consider the approval of the DTE poll uh, relocation. Uh, do you have a PowerPoint for this, or do you want us to pull up the can you pull up the memo so people can see that? Or sorry, is there whatever's in the packet? Yeah. Yeah. Just so people can see on the okay. screens and stuff. So people can read along with you. Okay. <laughs> so I've shortened this up a little bit. The <clears throat> the replacement of the sanitary sewer on the south side of Long Lake Road between Groton Road and uh, Pine Tree Trail is now complete. Uh, Long Lake Road pavement improvements and site landscape restoration are forthcoming. Uh, at the February 28, 2022 board meeting, the board approved an agreement with DTE to temporarily re relocate three existing DTE utility poles outside the work area to accommodate the installation of the pilings and water main and sanitary sewer. The township also obtained an easement, agree or easement agreements from the affected property owners as part of the initial DTE contract. The temporary easement language included conditions that the relocation of the DT utility poles was temporary and the poles would be returned to the original locations once the sanitary sewer replacement work was completed. In order for DT to proceed with the requested work, the attached agreement uh, must be approved by the township as well as payment uh, to DTE in the amount of $48,501.92. Staff is recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the uh, attached DT agreement. Uh, uh, DT Energy Company Accounts Receivable Agreement authorized Township Supervisor Walsh to ex execute the agreement and direct accounting to prepare a check in the amount of $48,501.92 to DT Energy Company for the work to be scheduled by DT. Uh, the funds for this work uh, by T DT will be paid for out of the Sanitary Sewer Capital Improvement Fund since the work uh, was needed to replace the sanitary sewer. Any questions? Any questions for Corey? Were they, were they low the bidder? It's sole source. <laughs> <laughs> nice. If there's no questions, I'd look for a motion. So moved. Motion by Support. Trustee Shostag. Support by Trustee Fakey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That does pass. Next we have the payroll and vouchers of April 10th. We've all had a chance to look them over. Unless there's any questions or comments, I look for a motion. So moved. Motion by Trustee Murray. Support. Support by Treasurer Keeps. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And last, oh, that passes. Uh, last is our motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Motion by Clerk Brooke. Support. Support by <laughs> Trustee Fakie. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That's All right. pretty good, We'll Danny. see everybody in two weeks.